afternoon. Uh, thank you all for being here. Um, I would like to start our time together this afternoon um, just with a moment of reflection. Um, this week uh, has been rough <laughs> um, in a lot of ways um, for a lot of people, but more uh, specifically, um, public education lost one of its biggest advocates, um, someone who was not afraid to step out and step forward um, to stand boldly on behalf of public education. Um, and that was uh, David Williams. Um, he was a tenured law professor, as you all know, at Vanderbilt University Law School, vice chancellor for athletics and university affairs at Vanderbilt, the first African-American to hold that role um, at that institution. He was also the first African-American vice chancellor um, and first black athletic director at the South, within the Southeastern Conference. He was general counsel and secretary at Vanderbilt for 13 years. A strong and consistent proponent of public education, uh, we've seen him here uh, several times. We've seen him step to the podium several times. Um, Co-chair of our transition report team, led a team of nearly 50 individuals uh, who gave us our 121 recommendations. He chaired the board of the Nashville Public Education Foundation. He chaired the board of the United Way of Middle Tennessee. His commitment to public education began in his hometown of Detroit, Michigan, and he shared the story often about being the child of an educator and having that love of education, that passion for public education instilled in him at a very, very early age. Um, he worked as a middle school teacher uh, in Detroit public schools for 10 years, and he said teaching was one of his first loves. So kudos for teaching, but middle school. He epitomized what a great public education, support from family and community, and hard work can do in helping propel, propel young people to reach their greatest potential. He was a huge proponent of equity and excellence in public schools. And there are many quotes that have been tweeted and posted on Facebook and many articles where the students from Vanderbilt have articulated that their experience was successful as athletes, as athletes of color at a majority institution, they know that their success was due to the fact that they had a David Williams at the helm, a David Williams making decisions on their behalf, a David Williams advocating for their success in the classroom first, and then their success on the field. He was a member of the Standing Committee on Public Education for the American Bar Association, which among its focuses is to empower teachers by providing resources that incorporate law and civics into K through 12 curriculum. He was well involved and connected throughout the Nashville community, working with numerous organizations, including the Community Foundation, Center for Nonprofit Management, Nashville Symphony and Nashville Sports Council, Second Harvest Food Bank, Adventure Science Center, 100 Black Men of Middle Tennessee, Special Olympics of Tennessee, and that is only to name a few. David was once quoted as saying, I believe in my soul that there is no I believe in my soul that there is no issue more important to a community's success than public education. I saw what happened in Detroit and Columbus when the public lost faith and confidence in its public schools. It had a devastating effect on those cities. I want to do whatever it takes to ensure Nashville never falls victim to that. And he didn't say this directly, but I think he expects each one of us to understand that and understand that as we sit here at this table, as we sit in this room, as we hold the positions that we hold and we're responsible for the things that we're responsible for, it is to ensure that the faith and the confidence in public education in Nashville is not lost. And so I challenge each and every one of us to think, to stop, inhale, exhale, and think. The smartest people in the world think before they say nothing. Before they say nothing. Thank you for the indulgence. I'm going to call the meeting to order. We'll stand for the pledge, please.
pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, we do have a quorum. I um, move for the adoption of the agenda. If there are any changes, Ms. Elrod. Yes, I pull um, to defer item number four, Board of Education's mediation motion. Are there any other changes to the agenda? I'd ask for a motion to approve the agenda with the change. So moved. Second. Second. All right. All in favor? Aye. Any opposition? All right, thank you. So just under the board chair's report, I have this on here so that we don't forget that we do have a responsibility that we need to get to and get to um, as soon as possible. I know there are some outstanding audit items and some outstanding concerns. Um, I know we have an audit report that's coming today. There's a report that has also been delivered to each and every one of the board members. And with that, I want to remind each of us at this table and uh, we'll make sure that we send a I'll put this in an email so that every board member gets it, that that audit that was done by Bone McAllister was at the behest of the board. So it is a, a privileged communication between that attorney and this board as a whole. No individual board member is, has the authority to disseminate this report. We're moving to committee reports, governance issues. Um, Ms. Pupa Walker, you have a report from your committee meeting. Thank you, Madam Chair. So we um, begin with uh, revisiting the water policy, which we've had a couple of conversations about. Um, and we, after much discussion, decided to um, defer a decision on the policy until we had some conversations led by Dr. Severe um, and other MNPS staff on sort of best practice and, and ways we can coordinate and align with other agencies to make sure we are following the best procedures possible. We also had uh, an extended conversation on the fundraising policy as it exists today and, uh, and, um, and how we can create more clarity uh, around that policy for our teachers who are uh, trying to raise funds to supplement uh, things that they have in their classroom. And so we also will pull together a group of administrators and teachers to further that conversation to make sure we have the best possible systems in place to allow teachers to raise funds or schools to raise funds. And then finally, we had um, a little bit of time to hear from a Metro clerk representative on lobbying and ethics disclosures. And so she kind of reviewed for us existing policy and we deferred until um, the next governance meeting to take up that conversation. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Uh, we're going to move into the good news is I'll ask our student ambassadors to come forward. Uh, I'd like to ask the group that donated the chocolate chip cookie. <laughs> Just raise your hand. Thank you so much. They have a box of Tiff's treats back there, and they're warm. And I got a chocolate chip cookie, and I, it was the best. Thank you so much. I do appreciate that. Y'all missed You saw me fading. I was fading fast back there. Student ambassadors from Hillsborough and Hunters Lane High Schools. Hello, good evening. My name is Leslie Garcia, and I am a senior in the Academy of International Baccalaureate at Hunters Lane High School. Many of you may know that the International Baccalaureate Program, also known as IB, centers around the IB Learner Profile, which consists of 10 qualities which aim to develop international-minded individuals. And because of the emphasis put on the um, uh, put on are put on exhibiting these traits, I was able to exemplify the characteristic of being a risk taker as I helped establish a debate club at my school. I wanted to create a club where students could be thinkers and inquirers as they express their own thoughts and opinions on controversial topics as well as global issues. As this club proved to be successful, drawing in crowds within our school, I was able to take a step further with setting the foundation for Hunters, Lane, uh, Hunters Lane's very first debate team. Once again, taking the risk and stepping outside of the box to form something new and unique to Hunters Lane. For being our very first year competing in the National Debate League, our debate team has be, been very successful. Not only have I received Best Speaker Awards and Team Awards, um, 
but our, our entire team was even recognized as outstanding debaters. And it is because my experience in the IB Academy, along with the global focus of the IB curriculum, that made the debate team and even club possible. Ac activities like debate require you to be knowledgeable as you must know both the topic you are defending as well as the topic you are opposing. opposing. The, they require you to be open-minded, bringing awareness to different perspectives and beliefs that one needs to consider. They also require you to be a communicator as you are forced to express your own thoughts and opinions as as well as deliver new, deliver new ideas and solutions. If it wasn't for being introduced to these imperative skills in IB, I would, ha I would have not been well equipped with the skills or mindset needed to start or participate in a debate club and team, which would have posed greater challenges. And it's due to being part of the IB Academy at Hunters Lane that I feel that I have the capability to achieve anything with global awareness and the skill set I have acquired and has prepared me to work in a diverse setting and environment. Thank you. A great position, too. Hello, my name is James Holloway. Um, I am under the Hospitality, Marketing, and Business Program. And during this program, I will, being in this program has been some of the most important years of my life. Within the title of the Academy, each word has a significant meaning to me, and each word has taught me something significant. So the first one is hospitality. It taught me professionalism and how to properly work in a business setting. Marketing taught me to promote myself and brand myself in a different way. Business taught me to look at everything from a different perspective and form a business sense in everything, from relationships to conducting actual business. During my four years within the Hospitality and Mar Marketing and Business Academy, I have participated in several different programs ex exclusive to my academy. I'm the vice president of DECA, a club based upon business um, business ethics, and I also participate in a job shadowing program at the Omni Hotel. Um, I also was awarded the opportunity to co-found my very own social media platform. It is a news-based media platform called Warrior News, and I, un I, I was awarded this opportunity through my advertising and CTE class led by Ms. Carol Harding. Here, she gave us the resources to make actual videos as if we were a real news team. She taught us how to edit. She taught us how to use the recording studio and everything in it, such as green screens and even high-quality high cameras. We were awarded the opportunity to film outside the school and much more. And with all of this being said, I just want to say that throughout the many years that I've been under this program, I've learned so much about school and the real world that I wouldn't. I'm sorry, <laughs> that I would say that the Business and Marketing Academy, or the Marketing and Business Academy, if I were talking to an incoming freshman, I couldn't steer them in any other direction but my academy. My name is James Holloway. Thank you for your time. Oh, awesome. Good evening, I am Milton Javari Henderson, a senior at Hillsborough High School, and I'm a part of the U.S. Community Credit Union <laughs> Academy of International Business and Communications, what we also call the Business Academy. So um, I am specifically in the marketing management pathway, and my um, role in my school, I get to work as the manager for what we call the Borough Brew during our lunch periods, and I get to um, allow, tell my peers, um, how I would like to run it on specific days. Um, so we learn communication skills with other peers throughout the school, as well as administration throughout the school, as well as learning um, stock and supply, um, as well as money management. So this, com this academy has really helped me a lot because it has taught me many things that will take me further within my career that I want to be in, which is to become an entrepreneur. I want to have my own bakery when I grow up. So just learning small little tips like this have helped me along the way, and I would honestly, honestly say that I have chosen the best academy for my future career. 
With that, I'm also in the International Baccalaureate Career-Related Programs, which is what we call IBCP. So I get to not only take those career-related um, courses, but also IBDP-related cl classes. So I take IB Physics, IB Math, and IB English, and I am duly enrolled and get to get college credit as well as honors credit, AP credits, and regular cor class course credits. So thank you. All right. Then. Hello, my name is Faith Dixon, and I'm, in a, I'm a part of the Academy of Global Health and Science in the Therapeutic Clinical Service Pathway. Within this pathway, I have learned basically what it means to be almost anybody in the healthcare industry. My sophomore year, we went to St. Thomas Medical Center downtown, and we literally went through each floor of the hospital. My favorite was the top, where um, we saw the overview of Nashville and how beautiful the city was. My junior year, I went to specialty care, and I did a mock surgery, so I was basically the general <laughs> surgeon and I took out a, a mock gallbladder. Within this academy, <laughs> sorry, within this academy, I have literally learned more about myself and more about my future career as I pursue to become a pediatrician and opening up my own private practice. Um, I have also like advanced my um, academia as becoming um, a member of National Honor Society and also being a part of um, IBCP as well, where I also serve on the advisory board as president. So I'm going out to underclassmen and telling them about the great things that IBCP has to offer. Thank you. Hello, board. Uh, my name is Francisco Sainz. Um, I go to Hillsborough High School as well, and I am part of the International Baccalaureate Diploma Program. So just like them, I also take IB courses. I take IB biology, IB psychology, um, IB math studies, IB language, IB history of the Americas, and theory of knowledge. In addition, I also take an exclusive class called Inter Interdisciplinary Science and Research, and we, we have the opportunity to um, observe rigorous science rigorous applic applicative science in the real world. So I've gotten the chance to work with cancer biologists. I've gotten a chance to actually go to Vanderbilt Lab and work with their t um, researchers and actually got, got a chance to do my own independent research there at Vanderbilt. And all of this has basically made me realize how much I care for science and communications with people, especially if they're in need of help. So thank thanks to these two academies, um, it's allowed me to basically learn that I have a passion for science. In addition, I'm also, IB has taught me how to be balanced. Um, I'm part of National Honor Society as well. Um, I'm the Vice President of Health Occupations for Students of America. I also run the Red Cross. Um, I'm in Youth and Government and Model United Nations, and I also deal with IB. <laughs> so yes, I, am, I learned how to basically balance my time, and this is very helpful for me since in the future during college, I'll learn how to manage my time both during class and out of class. I'm tired, just listening. Um, so we have, uh, we have an art display from Cane Ridge. Uh, Mrs. Bush will speak on that. And HD Middle School Choir, I believe, is Mrs. Froke. Ms. Bush. Yes, is the art display outside? It's in the lobby. It's in the lobby. Okay, okay, great. Um, tonight's artwork was created by second grade students at Cambridge Elementary. Their teacher, Miss uh -huh. Rachel Mata Ta uh, Town, took a trip last summer to Santa Fe, New Mexico, where there she visited the desert home of painter Georgia O'Kefe and took pictures of the landscape that inspired more than two dozen of the artist's painting paintings, I'm sorry. Each student studied a photo, then created their own version of it. They even mixed their own paint colors. Please look at their display after the meeting. Thank you. So I'm honored to have an opportunity to talk about H.G. Hill. Uh, this has been my children's school, and they've had amazing experience there, and I have a son who is still there. Um, I want to um, introduce our choir director, Carly Brantley, who was here earlier tonight. She is the choral director at H.G. Hill Middle School. Before returning home to Nashville to teach for Metro, Public, uh, Metro Nashville Public Schools in 2014, she was the choral director at I.B. Tigret Middle School in Jackson, Tennessee for five years. Since Ms. Brantley started the choir program at H.G. Hill in 2014, the number of choir students has grown to over 200 members of 5th through 8th grade students. 
The H.G. Hill choirs sing a diverse wealth of music from modern gospel to renaissance, and, is, and the choirs are open to all children without an audition in all four grade levels. Ms. Brantley helps include non-choral students by facilitating talent shows, Black History Month programs, and is the musical director for H.G. Hill's first musical, Milan, in the spring of 2019 which my son is also in. <laughs> in 2016, Ms. Brantley was voted Teacher of the Year. She serves on her school's local, uh, on, sorry, she serves on the school's leadership team as the Related Arts Department Chair and is also a member of the Performing Arts Content Council. And I would be remiss if I didn't also give a shout out to Dr. Carrie Jones, who's our wonderful principal, who's helped facilitate so many of these new arts program um, programs at the school. Thank you very much. We're going to go into awards and recognition. Okay. okay. As slow as I could. Okay, we got it. And we'll begin <laughs> uh, with Devon uh, Starling from Cambridge High School, the Class 6A Mr. Football. So if Devon could come up with his coach, uh, Eddie Woods, and principal. <laughs> Devon Starling uh, earned the Tennessee Class 6A Mr. Football as the state's high school football player of the year. Uh, class 6A is Tennessee's largest classification, and Devon is the first Mr. Football recipient for Cane Ridge High School. Uh, this se right. <laughs> This season, Devon rushed for 2,159 yards and scored 25 touchdowns. Woo! led the Ravens to an 11-1 and record and a region championship. He was also the Hume Award finalist. Devon will be attending the University of Memphis on a full academic scholarship. He will play football for the Tigers and will study accounting with plans to earn his MBA. Congratulations, Devon. We are extremely, extremely, extremely proud of you. Picture, Ms. Bush. Picture. Yes, and we do want to say he is the first one in Metro for this class, not just Cane Ridge, but the first Mr. Football for MNPS in this class division. Yes. Being from New Orleans, I just want to say the Super Bowl that never really did happen could have used you. <laughs> it really wasn't a Super Bowl. that um, Devin's parents are here in the back, aren't they? I saw, yes, we talked in the parking lot. <laughs> to the two of you, um, you know, he's all right, but we know why he's as good <laughs> as he is. Uh, and next. Next we have uh, Dr. Anne-Marie Gleason, the Harpeth Valley Elementary School, who is the National Association of Elementary School Principals uh, Board of Directors. So we'll call uh, Dr. Gleason up to the front. There she is. Okay, congratulations. Congratulations are in order to Dr. Anne-Marie Gleason, the principal of Harpeth Valley Elementary School. Uh, Dr. Gleason has been named to the board of directors of the National Association of Elementary School Principals, NAESP. Uh, she has a three-year term that is beginning uh, this summer. Uh, Dr. Gleason, we are proud of you and we appreciate your leadership and dedication to Harpeth Valley and your work with the National Association of Elementary School Principals. Thank you.
Thank you very much, and congratulations. Thank you so much. So it is now time for public participation. The board will hear from those persons who have requested to appear at this board meeting. In the interest of time, in the interest of time, it's actually on here twice, so I'm reading it twice. In the interest of time, interest of time, speakers are requested to limit remarks to three minutes or less. Three minutes or less. Thank you. Comments will be timed. At the end of the three minutes, you will hear this bell. Um, the names are up on the uh, screen. Um, and we had a new process for signing up, so I hope that worked out well for everybody. And we'll start with Mr. Who. Good evening, members of the board. First of all, let me start, um, Dr. Gentry, by um, thanking you for your kind words about David Williams and the work he has done for our schools and our students. Um, as, as I look back over the last um, several years, we have had a growing problem in this district where we have classrooms that are left vacant. Um, they're either filled by a substitute if one's available. I mean, I'm talking about classrooms where there is no teacher assigned because of a vacancy. Um, obviously, there are some economic impacts that are driving these, driving these vacancies, which we've mentioned. But um, there is a national teacher shortage, and it is becoming more of a challenge for some of our colleagues to get licensed in the state of Tennessee, either as new educators or coming from other states. So um, I, I think it's very important that what MMPS do is we establish a culture that's welcoming and that we not only focus on making sure that our teachers, paraprofessionals, and other employees are well compensated at market rate, but we have to make sure that our schools are welcoming so that our employees don't find it necessary to um, search for other employment elsewhere. I could tell you plenty of stories where, um, where teachers have left because of stress related to their supervisors. And I think a few years ago, Dr. Gentry, I remember you saying in this very room that um, employees don't quit their jobs, they quit their bosses. And so we need to make sure that we're not ha employing bosses who are getting people to quit for them. So I wish we would do some concentrated work on trying to figure out where the problems are and trying to figure out how to fix those issues. So as we move forward, I hope we can um, make Nashville schools a better place to work, more welcoming for our students and our employees, and also um, make sure that we get the resources from our community that surely are out there. We just haven't been able to get them. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Amanda Kale, followed by Katie Kaur and Mark Melman. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the board. My name is Amanda Kale. I'm a teacher at Margaret Allen Middle School. Um, and I'm going to follow what I tell my students, which is I don't repeat. I say, I agree with you, and I would like to add. Um, so I'm here to ask for one thing, uh, building on Dr. Huth here this evening, um, that whatever decision you make going forward, please do not continue to hold teachers' salaries hostage. I don't think that is your intention, but that is becoming the effect. And I know that there's deep divisions here, but you have the power to allocate funding how you see fit. And it's becoming unreasonable to continue with no raises for MNPS teachers and staff because of other battles. Teachers are now essentially finding themselves in the familiar terrain of government employees during a shutdown who see their pay held hostage by warring factions. The fact is our salaries have been effectively frozen for over a decade and the cost of living has skyrocketed. Ignoring that fact will only lead to more kids with a revolving door of teacher, first year teachers or no teacher at all. Continuing to argue for increased social emotional support for our kids but refusing to fund it means that any support that does happen is charity work that comes from the kindness and generosity of people who are being grossly underpaid. Continuing to purchase and implement new programs to improve teaching and learning in our district is useless in classrooms that are being taught by subs. 
Freeze other lines in the budget that are problematic if you must, but it's time to pay the men and women who do the work of this district. Please put 5% raises and step raises back in the budget with the understanding that we will do so every year until salaries are where they should be. Show that you are committed to making sure our kids have the best education and we will fight for you. At my school, over half of the faculty and staff now work second jobs to make ends meet. Our EL teams spent their Thanksgiving break delivering food to our stu students' families' homes. Our soccer coach personally provides transportation to most of his entire team. And one of my colleagues, who is a beloved mentor to so many of our kids, who comes early every day and leaves late every day, was recently in a fender bender because he fell asleep at the wheel on the way to a home visit. So when you continue to deny us raises, I just want you to remember those stories because we love our jobs and we love our students and we give 110% every day and asking for 5% in return is not that much. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Erica Mitchell, and I am with United Way of Metropolitan Nashville. Katie Kerr was here, but had to leave to tend to a family matter. Um, I'm here to speak on the group um, on, on the uh, behalf of a collective of nonprofit partners here in Nashville. We're all here today with the same intention. We want to do the best for our kids. Oftentimes, the public puts this onus solely on parents and the school systems, but as many cities around the country have learned. Raising a future generation is a community effort. That's why community partners are critical for the success of any school district to build capacity and backfill needs. When we truly leverage community partners, we can, treat, we can create an ecosystem of support for our public schools. And luckily for our city, we have no shortage of groups and expertise to call upon. For example, the Nashville Public Education Foundation supports MNPS by helping to secure private funding that builds capacity for the district and provides strategic investments to help move the needle for all kids. Pencil connects the generosity and skills of community members and businesses directly to schools and students. Alignment Nashville pulls together working groups for solutions and innovation on things like social emotional learning, teacher retention, and school nutrition. Communities in schools reduces chronic absenteeism by identifying root causes, building relationships with students, and bringing resources and wraparound supports into schools. My organization, United Way, provides funding, programming, and resources to support students and family stability, health, and economic mobility. These are just a handful of examples, and there are many others, including the library, the mayor's office, the chamber, Conexion Americas, and other generous citizens. We all bring something distinct to the table, but we make the biggest impact and the most change when we work together in an integrated system with the district. <laughs> Very quickly, um, we hope that as you continue the to work toward district goals, you will tap this ecosystem to help you get there. Know that you can rely on this team and the team of many of the partners to help you and the district achieve all that you set out to do. We are committed to MNPS students, and we are part of your solution. Thank you. Uh, Mark Melman, Kelly. What? The names are on the screen. Mark, Kelly, Teresa Wagner, as you are, whoever's closest to the podium. Let's go. All right. Good evening, Madam Chairman and Board. I'm Kelly, and I live in Hermitage. As we approach the budget season, I would like to really see us support our teachers by approving raises and step increases. Our kids' greatest resource is our teachers. When the teachers are paid well and happier in their job environments, then our kids will be the very first to receive the benefits. I've done my diligence in corresponding with our mayor and council and asked that we all stand together to better fund our schools. However, that must not be the only thing we do. The Bible calls us to be good stewards over what is entrusted to our care, whether it be time, talent, or money. We as a district need to take a hard look at what we are spending our money on. All of us have to take a hard look at what we need versus want when examining our personal budgets, and so it must be for our district budget also. In a district that is chronically underfunded, 
Do we really need administration driving in large SUVs for one person, or would a full-size automobile with better gas mileage be a more logical and less expensive choice? Or would paying out the maintenance fee for the use of their personal vehicle be the better choice? We need to make sure we are getting the most needed service contracts instead of the ones with the bells and the whistles. Our true assets, such as teachers, bus drivers, and crossing guards should come first. Building upkeep and maintenance is also extremely vital because this is where our children learn as well as spend most of their time. I would argue that funding for programs such as Cambridge and other accelerated programs be mandatory for all middle and high schools instead of select schools. We should make program funding the same as one school as another so we don't see population in certain schools skyrocket. This alone would certainly help with transportation costs as well as create true equality. It would also help our horrible traffic. This year in particular is going to be a difficult one for the district. As of the coming school year, the new Tennessee PE law will go into a full effect, requiring all K through eight students to have 60 minutes of PE per week. This will mean some skills will have to exchange vital positions, such as another related art teacher, AART, or the loss of vice principals in order to make their budgets work if we don't plan carefully. We shouldn't have to sacrifice important roles in our schools just to make ends meet. We have good work to do, and we need to get to it and make sure our budget is on point. Thank you for your time. Good evening, Dr. Gentry, Dr. Joseph, and members of the board. My name is Teresa Wagner. I live and teach in Board District 6 and currently serve as m &A Vice President. I come before you with two topics this evening. My first comments are around the budget for the 2019-20 fiscal year. I know that hard decisions are being made. I'm also certain that salaries are a hot topic. My ask around this is that no salary increases be budgeted for anyone in an administrative position until every teacher who has sacrificed so much for this district is guaranteed a pay raise. The argument has been made that you cannot attract high quality administrative staff without competitive salaries. But I ask you, just who are these people going to supervise when a significant number of teachers flee the district? and even teaching profession because they simply cannot afford to both lose income and spend what little they have supporting their own classrooms. Once again, I ask that you all present a united front when this budget is presented before the Metro Council in order to send the message that this budget is necessary and will be managed in a fiscally responsible manner. My second topic is to ask for your support of the resolution against vouchers that is up for consideration tonight. This resolution is similar to the one passed by the Knox County School Board. We already see how charter schools negatively affect our budget through that particular line item. Vouchers would further impact our state funding in a negative manner. I believe that taking a firm stance against vouchers from the beginning rather than in reaction to potential legislation will send a strong message to legislators and, hopefully, prevent the matter from even, be, even being considered. I would like to thank Mrs. Shepard for following up with me after my last appearance and bringing this resolution forward. One more thing, and this wasn't planned. Dr. Joseph, the ball was dropped two weeks ago. When you brought back the two-hour delay two years ago, I was happy that we had a sensible way of dealing with certain weather issues. If any days were made for that two-hour delay, it was January 30th and 31st. Instead, the safety and well-being of students and employees was put at risk, not once, but twice, for no clear reason. And then we were met with emails and tweets that totally insulted our intelligence. Even students saw through this as evidenced by their replies on Twitter. This episode has shaken my confidence in the ability of MMPS decision makers to act in the best interests of students and employees, and I hope actions are taken to ensure that this does not happen again. I thank you for your time and the opportunity to speak tonight. And Sharon, I happen to love middle school. Good. I hated it. <clears throat> All right, we've got Mark. Melman, Laura, Barbara, Angie, Adams, anybody? Any takers? Good evening, Dr. Gentry, members of the board, Dr. Joseph. My name is Angie Adams, and I'm the CEO of Pencil. Pencil was founded 37 years ago with the core belief that public education needs community involvement and leadership. Pencil was a joint project by many of the top employers in the city who strongly believe that their employees can make a difference if regularly engaging with students inside school buildings. 
We are pleased that our, as our ambassadors mentioned tonight, many of our top employers are still pencil partners, such as Vanderbilt University, HCA, St. Thomas Health, Bridgestone, Gaylord Opryland, Dollar General, Ingram Industries, Deloitte, LP Building Products, U.S. Community Credit Union, as well as hundreds of small and medium-sized businesses, such as Rogers Group, Medic One, or Stantec. Over 300 businesses support our academy students so that 3,600 10th graders annually have field trips and workplace settings. More than 3,200 11th graders have job shadow experiences and workplace settings. And our pencil partners are mentoring seniors who are studying for certification exams. Last acad academic year, the LP Pencil Box made sure that students and teachers received over $1.2 million of high quality new school supplies so they were prepared for the classroom. Pencil manages six family resource centers that are school-based with businesses partnering with those sites to assure that students have barriers removed to their academic success and attendance such as food assistance, housing assistance, English language classes for the family and parenting classes. We certainly promote and support general partnerships so that reading partners exist, that STEAM and middle schools have business partners bringing that curriculum to life, and that corporate teams provide support for school-wide activities such as field day and other events. Our documented economic impact to the district was $4.1 million by our partners' time and talent and treasure last academic year. Our goals for next academic year are to assure that more than $1.5 million worth of high quality new supplies are placed in teacher and student hands, that academy students continue to have real world experiences to enhance their education, and that we continue to recruit and engage the top employers in our city with our students. We work collaboratively with district leaders, principals, and teachers to assure that they have partners engaged in ways that are meaningful for their students. On behalf of our board, staff, and pencil partners, we are very pleased to be of service to the district students, and thank you for your time. Thank you. Hi, good evening. I think we got a little out of order here. My name is Becky Peterson, and I'm a longtime resident of Nashville and an educator, and I'm here to speak on both my behalf and that of Dr. Barb Stingle. We are part of the teacher education faculty at Peabody College Vanderbilt University and we stand today to address the positive experience we've had working with Dr. Joseph and his team on projects and partnerships related to teacher education and teacher development. Our comments are based on nearly three years of rich collaboration marked by respectful and productive interaction. Dr. Joseph places a priority on joint efforts that are mutually beneficial, where the whole is more than the sum of the parts. In our experience, this is one of the best things about him, in addition to his deep understanding of what learning requires for all children. It's our observation that this attitude of collaboration starts at the top with Dr. Joseph, but pervades the efforts of, with all of the folks that we work with. This includes teachers, coaches, principals, central office and staff working in the domains of curriculum and HR, research office personnel, and members of Dr. Joseph's cabinet. We have repeatedly encountered educators and administrators who share information, plans, and priorities freely, who seem intent on revealing rather than concealing the state of things so that we together can do better. We have experienced Dr. Joseph to be thoughtful, open, and polite. He asks good questions when we consider new projects and does not assume support before it is offered. He is anchored to the priorities that have been articulated by the board, the transition team, and his own team, most recently on the three priority KPIs. His first move is to assess whether something supports these priorities and then to connect us with district personnel who are both closest to practice and that have the expertise and authority to help us reach those goals. In our experience, all of these folks that he connects us to come through, and we offer just a few examples, with apologies to all of those that I don't name right now. Monique Felder, Barbara Lashley, Jill Petty, and many others with literacy expertise inside and outside of the district who developed the ambitious literacy plan focused on reading and thinking skills in tandem with content area that's now being implemented. Cito Narcisse, Lisa Coons, Deborah Story and Sharon Pertiller, several of our principals with whom we've worked to develop teacher leadership in priority schools. 
David Williams and his associates in STEM fields with whom we have supported successful ongoing partnerships like SSMV and the new STEM school efforts. Sonia Stewart, Lisa Coons, and others from teacher education institutions around town with whom we're imagining a residency program. That so many quality educators and educational leaders are available is what makes these collaborations possible. We who count ourselves as educators need more resources. That isn't a question. But as we work together toward this goal, we also pledge to the larger goal that binds us to encourage each MNPS student a solid sense of self and an understanding of what they have to offer this richly diverse community. Thank you. Good evening, Chair, members of the board, and Dr. Joseph. My name is Christine Keeley Dinger, and I'm President and CEO of the Healing Trust located here in Nashville. I'm also a resident uh, in member of Poopa Walker's district. I'm speaking today, however, in my role at the Healing Trust. We're a private grant-making foundation in Nashville that's given almost $90 million to nonprofits focused on physical health, mental health, recovery from addiction, and healing from abuse, neglect, and violence. As a representative of Nashville's philanthropic community with a deep commitment to mitigating adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs, we applaud MMPS for seeking to sustain trauma-informed school practices. This board is well aware of the impact of ACEs on a person's mental, physical, and behavioral health throughout life, as well as the prevalence of ACEs in both our student and adult populations in Honesee. I did not know that all of the community partners were gonna be here today, but I also wanna give them my appreciation for their support and their work supporting those many out of school necessary resources that make academic learning possible in our community. So thank you to the Public Education Foundation, United Way, Alignment, Communities and Schools, and others that are here. A recent Sycamore Institute study found that over half of adult Tennesseans report at least one ACE between 2014 and 2017, and about 17% had experienced four or more ACEs. Another academic research report found that 45% of students are likely to have at least one ACE in a typical elementary classroom, and by high school that number jumps up to 13 out of 30 students who have experienced three or more ACEs. The board, I'm sure, is well aware of the factors that are considered ACEs, but in addition to those predefined ACEs, there are other causes of toxic stress, including racism, racism and the stress experienced by our immigrant and refugee populations within metro schools. With regards to learning, the more ACEs a student has, the more at risk for low academic performance, language difficulties, and behavioral and disciplinary issues. We do want to acknowledge the key efforts of Mary Cernoborni and Matthew Portel at Fall Hamilton in the implementation of this work. And we also appreciate Dr. Majors and Dr. Joseph's strong support of trauma-informed schools because we know that addressing trauma helps to foster resilience and keep children from developing addiction and health issues later in life. The Building Strong Brains grant, which was a state-funded grant, initially supported the creation of trauma-informed school practices funded ACE awareness through extensive professional development training and prevention and intervention strategies to better serve our district students. The approach isn't just for kids who have experienced trauma. Research shows that all children benefit from an environment that is trauma-informed. I'm here to state that there is philanthropic support to provide a level of match funding this year for trauma-informed schools in order to bridge the gap from funding from the state grant to hopefully into Metro's operating budget. We compliment the board for your work, which has involved and invested to date, which has positioned the district as a national leader in trauma-informed schools. And as a funder, we continue to advocate for investment in these programs for the current health of our children and the future health of our city. Thank you. Hey, my name is Joseph Gutierrez, and I'm a resident um, in Belshire Terrace, just right outside Belshire Elementary. Um, I come today as another representative of Nashville's philanthropic community, but also as Tennessee, one of Tennessee Educational Equity Coalition's Mosaic Fellows this year. Um, I want to just voice our support in that we too are ready to some of the, um, provide some of the match level funding for the trauma-informed school specialists as the end of the grant period comes to a close. Um, the Data Market Maddox Charitable Fund's mission is really to support, to better our community through strategic investments in wildlife conservation and improving the lives of young people. Since our inception in 2008, we've provided over 20 million in support, um, with over 75% of that going to nonprofits serving students in and outside of educational settings. 
Um, since our inception, we've never used our voice in this capacity to really speak out on sort of the issues in the city, but we feel so strongly that ACEs are a prevalent but invisible problem in our city, that they greatly impact the lives of our black, brown, and lower income communities. Um, early data shows that ACEs have a significant impact on chronic absenteeism and, suspension and suspensions, and we know that the, way, the best way to improve educational outcomes is to keep children in the seats of the classrooms. So we feel that this trauma-informed care approach can mitigate toxic stress and promote a safe learning environment. Um, this trauma-informed care approach also has shared, builds shared awareness of the adversity and the stress that students face in their daily lives. We'd like to highlight that the 70 trainers throughout the district and through the Train the Trainer model have reached over 10,000 individuals, teachers, school staff, and nonprofit professionals working in the space. Um, they're promoting resiliency and helping to mitigate the impact of toxic stress. MNPS also has 10 trauma-informed schools, best example by the work at, being done at Fall Hamilton. I feel that MNPS is really gaining recognition sort of, for sort of this work, and that can really be highlighted by that video on Fall Hamilton on Edutopia. And if you haven't checked it out, you all should. Um, so just to really close that, the philanthropic community here in town really supports this work, and that it's made such an impact on sort of the lives and communities of our students and the problems that they're really facing. So thank you. Thank you. Good evening, board. My name is Grace Ann Visser, and I'm a board-certified art therapist. The field of art therapy is a master's level credentialed mental health profession. I have been collaborating and partnering with the EL department for the last five months, serving the SIFE students at Haywood Elementary, Tusculum Elementary, McMurray Middle, Overton High School, Glencliff High School, and Hunters Lane High School. If you're unfamiliar with the SIFE program, it is students with interruption in formal education. That, when you boil it down, essentially means these are our students that have been recently immigrated to the United States. These students are learning English for the very first time on top of acclimating to these huge and drastic changes culturally that they're going through. I wanted to speak with you tonight about the tremendous growth that we've seen in the SIFE students in the last five months since I've been able to begin my work with them. Um, I began working with them at the beginning of October. And when we first began partnering with the EL department, I came into the classrooms with an energy and a focus trying to establish serve and return relationships, which are very important, particularly for students that have been experiencing ACEs, just as the previous two speakers have been speaking about. Um, as we began to then establish those serve and return relationships, we then started to delve into a little bit more of the idea of where is home and what is home and establishing senses of safety within school. Um, we begin to build a bridge between those gaps and their understanding of home and where they are now. The majority of the SIFE students I work with are from Tanzania, from Congo, Honduras, and Guatemala. These students are new to America, they're new to our way of life, they're new to our systems, and even our language. After focusing on home and building a rapport with these students, we began to focus on social emotional growth and development, as well as regulation. When I first began running groups, we would often see tears, fear, anger, plentiful acting out, um, outbursts, fights, you name it in the classroom, because these students are extremely overwhelmed with what's happening. Students shutting down, unable to cope and even sit at a table with their peers to be able to engage in the rest of the classroom discussions. It wasn't uncommon for fights to break out in the classroom due to massive amounts of trauma and ACEs that these students have endured in the early years of life. However, this week as I ran art therapy groups in my Tusculum elementary group, we began making art by tearing tissue paper and collaging it together to create a scene. Previously, the idea of imperfections in tearing paper and it not turning out perfectly would have crushed these children. But with the joint efforts of the SIFE teachers and our art therapy collaboration, they were able to process through their disappointment and frustration in safe manners. I was able to model for them safe outlets for their anger that they were then able to implement these modules and these new understandings in their classroom and continue to engage in their classroom activities. We hope that as we continue our work with these SIFE students that they will only continue to grow and adapt to all of the changes and begin to step out of the current PTSD, ACEs, and trauma experiences and being able to continue to step into further growth. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Perfect. Howard Gentry, then Stanley Weber, and then Margaret Avery Day, something really fancy at the end. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the school board, 
and uh, Dr. Joseph. Uh, thank you for your time and the privilege to speak to you tonight. I'm Howard Gentry, and I'm here to share about an important program that is having a significant and positive impact on our schools. It's called United for Hope. In 2011, former Metro Schools Director Dr. Jesse Register asked Executive Officer Tony Majors to oversee an initiative that I was part of creating that involved engaging Nashville's church community in order to support some of our most highly priority schools. At the time, this pilot program included five churches partnering with five metro schools. The idea was to see if area churches could work effectively with public schools by cultivating groups of volunteers to work with students and teachers who desperately needed support and to see if they could do so in a way that respected our laws that separate church and state. After four years, the pilot program grew to 10 churches and the seeds of United for Hope had taken root. United for Hope is a ministry of Operation Andrew Group, a local faith-based organization that calls on area churches to look past denominational differences and unite by using common faith to better the city of Nashville. I represent United for Hope on Operation Andrew's board. United for Hope provides a critical volunteer network for young people desperately in need of hands-on, one-on-one academic and emotional support. Perhaps you've heard of the amazing statistic that Nashville has more churches per capita than any other city in the United States. There are more than 900 churches in Davidson County. Now think of those churches as hubs of potential volunteers to support the 89,000 children in our school district. United for Hope serves as a conduit between Nashville's churches and the Metro Public Schools. At the onset of Dr. Joseph's administration, he conveyed to United for Hope that he needed the faith community, the volunteers and their support if we were going to move the needle significantly in our schools and MPS could not, MP, M MPS could not do this alone. He often said, if there was a city that should really get it and be a light to the rest of this country, it should be Nashville. As our relationship and trust with Dr. Joseph grew, his request became bolder in asking United for Hope to supply every metro school with a church community partner. His vision is inspiring and we're making huge strides as we work to accomplish this objective. Today, thanks to Dr. Joseph and Dr. Majors, United for Hope is working with over 60 church partners across the city and is on track to be at 100 churches by the end of this academic year. United for Hope is now working closely with Metro Schools, and now I would like to bring a stand up to uh, our executive director to talk about the program. Good evening, um, Master um, Chair and uh, Dr. Joseph and Board. Uh, I'm Stan Weber. I'm Director of United for Hope. Uh, and I want to thank you, <clears throat> Mr. Gentry, um, as uh, a member of the Board, uh, for your time this evening. Uh, United for Hope is truly blessed to have such a tremendous and impactful champion as Howard Gentry, as you all know. Uh, Mr. Gentry explained United for Hope creates partnerships between schools and churches so that Nashville's children can thrive. When schools, churches, businesses, and the community come together, we bring hope with an ongoing commitment. The challenges our children face in schools are not an isolated issue just for the school to address, but rather they are community opportunities, is how we see it. Dr. Joseph has said, if a child comes to, an, comes to us dis, disadvantaged and leaves us disadvantaged, then we missed an opportunity. United for Hope exists so that those opportunities for having a lasting impact on a child aren't missed. We do this by recruiting and training volunteers from a growing number of local churches and embedding them in metro schools where opportunities for impact are the greatest. As Mr. Gentry mentioned, we are on track to be working with 100 local churches by the end of, of this academic year. Our challenge to churches is to look outside to serve the community and make Nashville a better city. We, we believe that by helping students thrive, we can transform the community. We found that once a church understands specific needs in metro schools and is given a framework that lays out how to meet those needs, then 
participation dramatically, dramatically increases. We provide the entire blueprint for successful partnership. Not only do we identify church partners, we train the volunteers, we foster relationships with principals, and we are the school li liaison, and we report back to Metro schools. United for Hope has four pillars of impact that are replicated after the community achieves model. And, and those being student achievement, teacher encouragement, teacher and staff encouragement, family engagement, and the in-kind contributions that are often needed. Our partnership model is aligned with the community schools model to ensure a seamless co collaboration. The results we're seeing are <clears throat> inspiring. We believe it takes a great we believe it takes great principals as leaders, highly committed teachers and staff, and strong community partners to support uh, to move a school off of the priority list. And this past year, three of the four priority schools <clears throat> that came off the list were heavily had heavy heavy engagement from the United for from the United for Hope churches. Uh, United for Hope's success is now being modeled across the country through Dr. Joseph's uh, liaison and his connections with Harvard University. Harvard has has discovered the opportunities that are that are um, afforded churches, and they are looking at United for Hope as that place of a model. And so, Dr. Tony Majors and I served on a design uh, group with Harvard about a year and a half ago, and commenced our first. Um, our first institute this past October, where, doc, where uh, Howard Gentry joined us as well. And needless to say that the vision that Dr. Joseph had uh, when he first came on the scene is being realized across the country. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Avery dickens de Hiron, and I live in Nashville. I'm here tonight as the executive director of Vanderbilt Center for Latin American Studies. Uh, and I want to share with you all about a partnership with Metro's Office of English Learners. Um, Vanderbilt Center for Latin American Studies is designated by the United States Department of Education as a national resource center for Latin America. There's only a handful of such centers in the country. And part of our mission is to help bring Latin America into the classroom for K through 16 educators, both here in Nashville and nationally. We do this in a variety of ways through curricular resources, professional development workshops, and cultural arts programming with community partners. This, this past fall, we've had a very successful partnership with Metro's Office of English Learners that has provided teacher training for over 100 Metro educators as well as family support. In early January, we presented a professional development workshop at Overton High School for Metro High School, high school teachers and middle school teachers called Teaching Students from Central America. I am a cultural anthropologist and I spoke about the culture and history of the region as well as the context and reasons for the current wave of Central American immigration to the United States. I was joined by our Mayan language instructor, Marika Zatler, who shared her knowledge of Mayan languages with the teachers. The teachers were eager for more knowledge to better understand the students in their classrooms, and so this had a very positive impact on them. Earlier in the fall, we did a similar program for teachers of students with interrupted formal education through the SIFE program that was previously mentioned. In addition to this professional development work, we have supported Metro families. Our Mayan language instructor has served as a volunteer interpreter for students who speak Mayan languages and for their families. This interpretation increases their access to important school information that they would not otherwise have. In sum, the partnership between the Office of English Learners and the Vanderbilt Center for Latin American Studies has been very impactful for our Metro teachers, students, and families. We are looking forward to continuing this partnership and are currently planning future professional development opportunities for Metro teachers. Thank you so much. Good evening, good evening. My name is Becky Sharp. Um, I want to thank you, Dr. Joseph, superintendents, board members, teachers, and administrators who served before you. Thank you for the education I experienced in Metro National Public Schools. I went first through 12th grade here at MMNPS, graduating from Overton High School in 1983 and attended all of my zoned schools. 
All three of my children did the same, graduating from Hillsborough High School and are now in, high, in college thriving and planning on graduate school. My daughter, who is a freshman in college, recently reported to me via text that she felt one of the reasons her transition from high school to college had been so easy was because of her MNPS experience. When an 18-year-old daughter calls her mother to thank her for not abandoning the public school system, it's a big deal. She said that she loved diversity. Please notice that I didn't say she was comfortable with or lacked fear of, but quoting her, she loves being around people who are different than she. So many doors are open to her because she is drawn to and curious about difference. She said that her experience at MNPS gave her an advantage that many of her college friends simply do not have as they attended schools where people looked alike, thought alike, and vacationed alike. Our public school system played a pivotal role in teaching my three precious children how to love diversity and make inclusivity a natural part of their existence. What a gift. Thank you does not seem close to what I owe our school system. The great majority of my friends have run from their own schools, some to private schools, some to charters or magnets. What my children needed, hundreds of other children need now, many of whom lack an adult like us in this room to fight and advocate for them. A counselor with time in the day to see them, a reading or math specialist, smaller classes, larger classes, more advanced classes, an inspired and fairly paid teacher, up-to-date books. Dr. Joseph, please ignore the attempts from those who seem to want you focused on anything but what you were hired to do. You are one of the very few Nashville leaders who is walking the walk and sending your children to their zoned school, and I thank you. <laughs> Board members, many of whom I love and respect and know, I owe you, and I'm paying you back with passion and participation and a willingness to say what some of you need to hear. You're being watched by other cities and becoming an example of a dysfunctional board. Be adult and lead. <laughs> Agree to disagree and fight in this room, but then support your director, Dr. Joseph. Use social media to share facts and all the many great things that are happening, not to gossip or vent. Read and follow the rules set out by this board. Please work together to complete the transition plan on which so many people worked and apply pressure to our city's elected officials and business leaders to fund our schools at at least $16,000 per child. Thank you. Madam Chair, board members, Dr. Joseph, my name is Clifton Harris, executive um, president and CEO of the Urban League of Middle Tennessee. And on behalf of the board of directors of the Urban League of Middle Tennessee, thank you for this opportunity to express um, our pledge and continued work with MMPS. The Urban League will continue its commitment to Napier Elementary School STEM program. Since we got involved with Napier STEM program, it has grown from one to two uh, STEM labs serving over 40 students um, with 50, with the ratio of 50-50 being uh, girls and boys. The Urban League will continue its commitment to um, uh, advocate in areas uh, like the Educational Report Card Committee with the Chamber. We will continue to support the um, Maplewood High School Firestone Program. We will continue to establish um, learning labs in the community to bridge the digital divide throughout Nashville and Davidson County. The League feels strongly about community partnership and participation. It would be easy for us to sit on the sidelines and criticize. However, the League chooses to be a, con a community partner. For 109 years nationally and 51 years locally, the League has participated in solving urban problems. Today, we are here to renew our pledge, our support to you, Dr. Joseph, and to the MNPS School Board. We must work together as a community to prepare our children for the success that awaits them. Thank you.
Good afternoon, Chair, uh, board members, and uh, Dr. Joseph. Um, my name is Brett Withers. I'm the Metro Council representative for District 6 in East Nashville. I just wanted to speak for a few minutes today, if I could. I don't get out here as often as I would like, but I um, would like to speak uh, for a couple minutes about uh, the proposal uh, to bring East Middle back to the main East campus. Uh, that campus actually lies just across uh, Gallatin from District 6, but I uh, comment to folks that uh, I get to look at that beautiful school all the time and I've adopted it as my own. Um, and um, um, I've had uh, a lot of constituent feedback that's been very positive about the uh, proposal to move East Middle back to East High. Those schools had been together for uh, most of the history. That school a few years ago uh, decision was made to relocate it to the Bailey campus, which is in my uh, neighborhood, in order to uh, try some different things. Uh, and um, it seems to be a good idea based on the rationale that was put forward on MNPS's website, which is very informative, uh, to bring East Middle and East High back together on Gallatin. Um, there are some logistical concerns that folks have raised. Um, uh, Board member Christian Bugs joined me and others uh, for a community meeting recently. It was actually the most engaged uh, and uh, constructive um, discussion about public education we've had in East Nashville in a long time. Uh, that can be a, a tense subject over in East where we like to battle about just about everything over there, but um, the amount of support that was shown for that uh, co-location was very, very strong. Uh, and in particular, um, there was a lot of support that was shown for keeping the two principles that are at East uh, Magnet High and Middle. And, and I think that's a very reasonable proposal if you can do that. Uh, if the teachers and the families feel very supported by their uh, principal leadership, it's good to keep them in place, um, uh, even with, uh, with a move coming up. So I just don't want to have too, too much change go on in the East all at one time. I think for many in the East community, it really is a homecoming. That's a lot of the feedback that I've heard. Um, but I uh, just wanted to echo that folks really seem to support the two principals. Would encourage you to go ahead and consider moving forward with that co-location, but please do consider keeping the, the leadership that you have in place. Um, one other thing that I did here, in addition to sports and athletic facilities, I heard uh, some commentary about trying to beef up and do some renovations to get a, a little bit larger library uh, there in the East Middle Building. Um, folks are enjoying the larger library that we have in the Bailey Building, but uh, if it's possible, uh, maybe maybe if not this first year, but make it a priority to do some renovations to get to get make sure that the East Middle School uh, has a, a good library facility um, and uh, just uh, wanted to reiterate those points. You may hear some more constructive feedback later, but I think it's a great move, as we all know, with budgets, if you're using your student-based budgeting, and a lot of that expense is going to a building and HVAC systems and things like that. If we can collocate those, collocate those schools back together and put all those dollars towards the students, that'll be great for everyone in East Nashville. Thank you so much. Good evening. Good evening, Dr. Gen uh, Dr. Joseph, Dr. Gentry, um, and school board members. Um, thank you for this opportunity for us um, collectively to weigh into the strategic priorities of our district and our school system. I am Chris Neal. Um, I have been in, around MMPS almost my whole life um, as a student, as a parent, as an educator in the Nashville community. Um, this is some school board trivia. Um, my father, Kent Weeks, was the very first elected school board chairman and served for 16 years. So I come with a long line of experience here in Metro. I'm also the director of the learning and design program at Vanderbilt University. And tonight, collectively with some of the other voices that have come also to the mic tonight, I wanted to echo the, the value of community partnerships. Um, this one focused with Vanderbilt. Um, I want to also focus on the ways in which I have seen this openness to partnership, the priority around it, and the invitation to community members grow in recent years. Um, MMPS and Vanderbilt collaborate in all kinds of ways, some of which we've already heard from tonight. Um, th this 
pervade STEM, the arts, literacy, social emotional learning. Um, I want to highlight four that are deeply or impactful to me at my work. When MMPS students learn beyond the walls of the classroom by engaging in authentic experiences in the field and in the community, they, they benefit greatly. They often work in Vanderbilt labs, they do field work um, with a variety of faculty, and they work alongside graduate students on projects that are identified sometimes by the schools and sometimes even by the students of Metro. In preparing teachers, kind of priority two that I'm involved in, um, for the district and beyond, district leaders and principals increasingly are inviting partnerships that are deepened and growing over time. Models such as teacher residency have grown out of these deepening partnerships and commitments to reaching out. This work is complex and it's mutual. Research partnerships, MMPS teachers and administrators share the wisdom, daily wisdom of their practice, and that advances research in teaching and learning at the national and the international levels. We know more now about effective school leadership, early childhood education, and supporting English language learners. Finally, in my own graduate uh, work and experiences in learning and design, we partner with teachers and schools on all kinds of things, one of which is project-based learning. This work begins with the voices as central to curriculum design. Through partnerships with a variety of schools, graduate students have supported MMPS students' agency and activism through their work on middle school students, um, working with the IB community projects, um, high school engaged in restorative justice. So again, these partnerships are in, in, innumerable, as we've heard from tonight. Thank you for partnering and continue to deepen that. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Lucas Leverett. I'm a West End middle school parent. I was really happy for the opportunity for a successful black leader to occupy the director of school's position. That was the one and only time the, the subject of race figured into this position for me. His successes and failures should not be judged as an issue of race. I once defended him, realizing the complaints against our new elementary principal were the oh-so-typical whining of millennials not wanting to be managed. They came, then came a litany of scandals. On his watch, revelations of backlash against dissenting teachers, educators living in fear of revenge, and a board member being told, I will embarrass you for daring to dissent. One outstanding issue, his car and driver could be solved right now if you had the willpower. Stick to his contract, verbatim. Retract the overpriced gas slurping SUV and driver issued the director a sedan and a set of keys and wish him luck like the rest of us. But now there's a new scandal. No bid contracts with insider negotiation prior to his tenure. In, it regards another suite of garbage software that isn't even fully implemented by teachers. A longtime friend who is a Metro teacher of 20 years boiled this down for me. Useless, your taxpayer dollars at work. Our teachers are bounced around between various forms of digital snake oil, and we now find the director wallowing in no-bid handouts to cronies. We're paying a premium for all this eyebrow raising. The director of schools is overpaid. If you're not here for the noble purpose of educating children for a more reasonable salary, this room has doors. We have more important things to do than play whack-a-mole with scandals. Our school system ignores biological fact regarding high school start times. We're desperate for bus drivers, set against the massive failure of, your, failure of your outsourcing. We don't have enough crossing guards. Parents like myself are disenfranchised, sending our kid out of district to a lottery school so no one has to care about our vote. And all of this is to say nothing of the usual challenges you deal with in this room every day. Madam Chair, to suggest this director be offered an extended contract is an insult. You may soon be negotiating your terms with a convicted criminal. One of his cronies got six months for the same kind of thing. Metro Council, thankfully, shot down a ludicrous measure that would have forced Ms. Spearing to apologize for a fictitious race scandal concerning the masks. Inspired by that, I would like to conclude my, my remarks by offering a mask to the director. 
This mask won't break the law because it doesn't conceal his identity, but it does put the correct apology in play, which, Dr. Joseph, is the least you owe the people and any colleague that you've threatened in defense of your transgressions. Thank you for your time. Madam Chair and Board Members, Dr. Joseph. My name is Ken Oliver, and it is my privilege to be the uh, Library Director of the Nashville Public Library. I'm here to share some good news you might not be aware of and say thank you to MNPS. Over the last several years, the Nashville Public Library and MNPS have cultivated a very strong and productive relationship, collaborating deeply and meaningfully because we have both have the same goal, student success. We could not do this without the help of Dr. Joseph and his team. Soon we will be celebrating an important anniversary, the 10th anniversary of Limitless Libraries, which is a nationally recognized collaboration intended to improve K through 12 success by providing access to high quality resources. We provided 150,000 books last year to over 50,000 students. With the help and support of Dr. Joseph and his team, we were able to increase the participation in the library's reading program during the summer through a partnership with two institutions and Alignment Nashville. We saw that a student who reads over 600 minutes eliminated the summer slide, eliminated the summer slide. This year, together, we're focusing on increasing the use of educator cards so all teachers can use public library materials to enhance their curriculum and classroom collections. NPL's Nashville After Zone Alliance <coughs> serves to expand the network of partners providing high quality out of school time opportunities for the most at risk middle school students. 1,500 students from 28 schools and 13 community-based community locations are participating this year. Studio NPL, which serves students inside library buildings as well as in schools and out in the community, is a makerspace program where teens develop critical 21st century STEM skills leading to greater academic success and college readiness and career pathways. Our digital inclusion team has worked with and continues to collaborate with the school staff, most recently on digital citizenship training pilots by providing curriculum development and training classes. NPL impacts all pillars of work from the blueprint for early childhood success. Schools provide support during the school day. The public library picks up where the school day leaves off. And then through our deep partnership together, we are that much stronger in providing the best learning environment for our kids. I want to thank Dr. Joseph for his commitment to literacy and reading, and it is a true commitment. For understanding the key roles it plays in school and life success, and for his continued partnership with the Nashville Public Library. He gets the fact that public libraries are not just nice, but necessary as a critical education partner. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Mary Louise Hemeter from Vanderbilt University. There's a bunch of us in the room today. I want to start, Dr. Gentry, by thanking you for your kind words about David Williams. I just don't think we can say enough about what he's mean, meant to public education, and I kind of want to say that we ought to be stopping and saying what would what would David Williams do and think that way. So anyway, that's not what I'm here to talk about, but thank you so much for those kind words. Um, I feel really passionate about the things I'm going to talk about, and I realize I have really limited time, so I hope all of y'all will feel like you can follow up with me in the future if you want to about these issues. But I'm here primarily to talk about my experience collaborating with 
primarily the MMPS pre-K department. And I want to talk about issues related to collaboration, but specifically as they have focused on social emotional learning, um, instruction for children with disabilities, and support for teachers. I moved back here 13 years ago, and I've been working with MMPS that whole time on research and training projects. And during that time, I've probably worked with, I don't know, 10 districts around the country, and or my team has. And rarely have we found a district so focused on quality, so willing to partner, and so investing invested in supporting teachers. And I think that's what I've found through the pre-K department here. Um, one of the most pressing educational issues, and certainly the one you've heard a lot about tonight, is the use of appropriate, positive, supportive, inclusive, and equitable discipline practices. And I think on a basic level, when you're talking about kids that I work with, three, four, and five-year-olds, they're simply not going to learn the social-emotional skills we need them to learn if we're asking them to leave school. Um, because of problem behavior. And I think the Metro Pre-K folks have been really committed to that and have been really committed to what do we have to do to support teachers to be able to support all children. And I think through our partnerships and through our research, we found that when we give teachers systematic, ongoing, intentional support, that they implement social emotional learning practices with fidelity. And when they do that, we see improvements in children's social emotional skills and reductions in problem behavior. And so the answer is, how do we get that to everybody? Because we've been doing that with through research partnerships. And I think the most exciting thing that's happened is within the last couple of years, we partnered um, and got a $7 million federal grant to ensure that teachers have the support they need to support children's social emotional learning, both in kindergarten and pre-K. And this is a big deal because these grants are highly competitive. They're rarely given to pre-K programs. And I think the fact that Metro got one was because of the quality of their preschool program. So I just want to end by saying I hope you're proud of the work the pre-K programs are doing. I hope you'll continue you to see it as a priority. I know for me that working with the Metro preschool programs has been one of the highlights of my professional career. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi. Uh, thank you for letting us talk tonight. Uh, my name is Greg Allen. I'm the president of Cigna uh, here in the Mid-South. And as you're aware, Cigna is the uh, health partner for you guys and your employees. So uh, one, we thank you for that. And we, we've been that way since 2011. Uh, we're committed to improve health, well-being, and peace of mind for your team members. Uh, that's why we're here. Uh, the last time I was here, I presented you, you all with a what Cigna calls the Well-Being Award for some of the actions you've taken to help with the to improve the health uh, of your of your uh, your team members, your coworkers, your employees. Uh, we continue to assist the MMPS Insurance Trust and Benefits Director David Hines in collaborating with your on-site clinic. Uh, which you should be very proud of. Uh, it's done very well. We've recently started uh, working with, okay, what else can we do besides healthcare? And so we work with nonprofits around town in various aspects. And so we've worked with uh, David and Dr. Joseph around, hey, what, what kind of things make sense? Uh, National Public Education Foundation is one we were already working with. And we participated in the Show Your Love uh, for Teachers campaign that, that again, helped drive some uh, awareness of your on-site clinic uh, for your employees. Also, in partnership with the state of Tennessee, uh, we've uh, provided a mental health first aid training for social workers, counselors, nurses, school security, bus drivers, and other, other team members to, to identify some of the mental issues that, that come along with some of our kids uh, and some of the uh, substance abuse disorders and some training around how do you identify it? What are some of those first outreaches and first steps uh, that folks can do? And so we've provided uh, the first of that training. We also uh, have been involved in other things we can do. And so we identified some project management skills training that I think you guys were looking at doing for some of your employees and team members. And one of the things we did is we said, hey, Sing is a pretty big company. We've got trainers. Why don't we fly a couple trainers in that, that can do this very well and provide that training? And I think the account was 80 some odd of your team members came out to our office, uh, 
All we did was provide food and the trainers, and then it was your team members with the, with the trainers kind of going through project management skills based training. So just wanted to come tonight to just kind of say our partnership goes well beyond uh, medical benefits and health benefits and the things that are offered from a benefit perspective. And we've tried to take it to the next level where we just kind of partner together. How do we use our resources collectively? Uh, sometimes it's a check writing uh, thing with a nonprofit. Other times it could just be, hey, we have resources. How can we help? So we just wanted to say thanks uh, for your, uh, your business but also thanks for the relationship and the partnership that we've been building over time and we look forward to the future. So thanks for y'all's time tonight. Good evening, Madam Chair, board members, and Dr. Joseph. I am Yolanda Hockett. I am standing here on behalf of the Haynes Trinity Neighborhood Coalition. The Haines Trinity Neighborhood Coalition is comprised of local neighborhood groups, faith-based institutions, and nonprofits. We are here asking you, the board, to resist approval of the land sale of 11 acres on Old Brick Church Pike. This bill is 2019-1476. We oppose this bill for four reasons. One. We oppose using the one-time sale of our public land to meet the $13 million budget deficit. Two, currently Metro schools' properties are listed on Metro Nashville's EBIT auction site with values of $12.1 million. An additional $4.7 million worth of properties were approved to sell by Metro Council on February the 5th, 2019. If you choose this solution, this eliminates the need to sell our park land to meet the budget shortfalls. Three, the 11 acre park sale is, is the key to the development of a public park for the Trinity Hill Ridge as it provides connectivity to another 83 acres of adjacent Metro Parks conservation land within two miles of downtown. Four, Metro Parks Director Monique Odom has already publicly stated that she's interested in this land. So we humbly ask you to prove the transfer of our land to Metro Parks. Thank you. Good evening, school board members and Dr. Joseph. My name is Samantha Perez, and I am the Director of Education Initiatives with the Nashville Area Chamber of Commerce. I'm here to take a few minutes to talk about the importance of partnership, collaboration, and shared goals. In my role, there are two ways in which it is apparent that partnership is critical to the district's goals and aspirations. First, I serve as the staff lead for the Education Report Card. The 27th Annual Education Report, Report Card was recently released and focused on social and emotional learning. As part of this process, the report card committee spent their time talking to state, district, and school leadership, meeting with community stakeholders, and visiting several of our schools. What was made clear in the committee's work was that collaboration is key to making Nashville and MMPS a national model for SEL. We benefit from in-house school and district experts, as well as strong and committed community partners when it comes to fundamental components of SEL, like restorative practice and adverse childhood experiences. In fact, two of the five recommendations from the report card speak explicitly to cross-sector collaboration with district and community stakeholders working to, uh, together to align resources and to study the impact of Nashville's growth on families with children. The second way in which partnership is core to my work is through the academies of Nashville. The Chamber, along with Pencil and Alignment Nashville, is a founding partner of the academies and is committed to their ongoing success. We're the region's largest business association, and the Academies of Nashville is central to how we talk about cultivating our local talent and preparing students for the skills they'll need for future careers. Thousands of people have come to Nashville to study this way of doing high school, and many are especially interested in learning how and why our more than 360 business partners are so engaged. The Academy's model would not work without business and community partners. They offer experiential learning opportunities like field trips, 
job shadows, internships, and mentorships on industry certifications. Just last week, the first art museum opened its doors to 330 10th graders in arts and design pathways from across the city. These students got to learn about creative careers from locals here in Nashville and explore the new exhibitions. These types of opportunities that take students out of the classroom and allow them to see themselves in a career are crucial and business partners provide experiences like this all the time. Some partners like Bridgestone, US Community Credit Union, and St. Thomas Health have even built actual learning facilities in schools that give students the environment and tools to do hands-on learning, but that also give them exposure to the business side of operations. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to my work and that of other business and community partners. I firmly believe that to accomplish our goals for MNPS, we need strong and committed partnership and collaboration between director of schools, school board, education stakeholders, and community partners. We hear great stories from student ambassadors about their experiences in, the, experiences in the academies. I'd like to encourage our business partners to also share their experiences. There's great work happening in our Thank schools you. and we need to Thank hear about it. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, good evening, Dr. Joseph and board members. Thank you for this time. My name is Carl Washington and I'm here to discuss a competitive wage as a CDL licensed MNPS school bus driver. I enjoy my job immensely, even with all the ups and downs we endure as drivers daily. When I started with MNPS four years ago, drivers were just giving back an hour from seven hours a day to eight hours. That was because of the shortage of drivers. Subsequently, we are again short of drivers and not getting a competitive wage. However, these are a few examples to make my case. Starting pay as a MNPS school bus driver is $14.53 an hour. CDL trash truck drivers starting pay is $16.50 an hour. Yes, the person who collects your garbage makes more money. MNPS bus drivers wage again is $14.53 an hour. A non-CDL animal control driver starting pay is $17 an hour. Yes, the dog catcher makes more money than school bus drivers. MNPS contracts drivers, SBC drivers, their starting pay is from $18 to $20 an hour. A private outside contract school bus driver, some start at $60 an hour for a two-hour route per a.m. and p.m., that's an average of $30 an hour. MNPS has discussed affordable housing for teachers. When we have MNPS school bus drivers living paycheck to paycheck, some have lived in their cars, hopped around with family and friends, to, or paid by week motels. We as drivers are 10-month employees, but receive only four or four four or five full 80-hour checks last year. Mind you, out of that check comes insurance premiums, which ranges for me, a single man, $115 a payday. A family plan is $350 a month. $14.53 an hour for MNPS school drivers is not a competitive wage, especially for people driving our greatest assets, our children. Safely to and from school every day. We are asking for a true competitive wage. Remember, we have families also. And again, thank you for your time and attention. My name is Odeonse Ames. I've been a Metro school bus driver for five years. I love my job, especially men and kids that want to be mentored. But some of today's kids have no regard for basic rules or consequences. They have no fear for authority because no matter how many times we write them up, the school nor the parents remotely have our back or follow through. You can have a student cursing, threatening a driver, and transportation supervision will tell you over the radio to get them home. A driver can have a major fight on the bus or have a busload of com students completely out of control and have students smoking marijuana caught on video just to be told that your supervisor is too far away or in a meeting. 
Then the next day, if you write them up, something may be done or nothing at all. Drivers have been physically assaulted by students, but after a brief suspension, they are let back on the bus and the driver has to continue to transport them. We have middle school kids that threaten to do violent harm to bus drivers or other students and nothing is done. We're told to keep a paper trail of behavior issues with each student, but if you write them up repeatedly, a principal can ask you to be removed from the school for too many write-ups. Who are we to go to for help? If you get a student discipline, you're subject to have a parent to come to your bus and threaten a driver and have to be done to that parent. But the driver may be removed from uh, the route for their safety. Transportation is limited on what they can or will do. Most kids are good kids, but get hindered by the behavior of others because they don't feel safe or protected as they go to school to try to further their education. These behavior issues are not just a bus issue, it's a public safety issue because I drive a 17-ton school bus loaded with students. A driver can't keep their eyes on a few kids that are causing the disturbance, and if they do, it can cause our own Chattanooga catastrophe. We need more monitors on regular bus routes. MPMPS Transportation has a dedicated fleet of drivers trying to do their jobs. Drivers need MMPS help to enforce the rules MMPS has put in place. We are asking for some type of unified district-wide discipline policy for MMPS school buses that will be followed and enforced. Thank you all for your time. Good evening, board members, Dr. Joseph. My name is Christina Driver. I was a contract driver through SBC for the past two and a half years. I was let go on January 16th, and the reason given was MMPS no longer needed me. I was assigned an inner city route, which was challenging, and I knew that going in, but I accepted it and approached the route with love and care. I'm certain that I reached some of the children, and I know that I made a difference on the route during the time I was assigned it. When it came to children and parents that required more help, I did not get the support that I needed. Parents are allowed to board the bus, refuse to get off, talk in ill-mannered tones, curse us, and even threaten us. Last year, I had a parent become so threatening towards me, I had to file a police report against her. I communicated to my field supervisor that I no longer felt safe on the route, and I asked if I could be moved. It did not happen. I've had a lot of other things that happened on the route that were unsafe, but my final straw was Friday, January 11th, when a middle school boy tried to physically attack me while I was driving the bus. I had to stop the bus, literally in the middle of the street, to obtain control of the bus. Once again, feeling unsafe on the route, I asked to be moved. On Monday, January 14th, I told SBC and MMPS Transportation I refused to continue driving this route. I went on to say that I was willing to go to any other cluster and drive any other route, but I was offered a route going into the same neighborhood. I refused that route as well due to it being a safety concern for me. Subsequently, I was told I was no longer needed, but MNPS drivers are still doing A and B runs morning and afternoon. Not needed, but kids are still double, triple, sitting three to a seat, being picked up, er picked up late and dropped off late every day. Not needed, but kids are on the bus stop 10 minutes early and some kids are still out up to an hour waiting on a bus. So if I'm not needed, who is? I hold a CDL license with all required endorsements. I passed a criminal background check. I passed a DOT physical as well as a drug test. I've had one at-fault accident, which was in my first year and was only a scrape. I had excellent attendance. All requirements met. So exactly who is needed? I did not ask MNPS for anything irrational. I simply asked to be moved due to safety concerns. Another driver drove the same route who was from SBC, and she felt in fear of her life, and she was moved to another route immediately. I just wanted to do my job in safety. I feel that I was singled out for speaking up on a social media post, and I have copies of that said post if you would like them distributed. I wrote this letter because parents need to be aware of what's going on. The drivers need reinforcement from, EMP, from MMPS of their own rules. The very rules posted on the bus are the ones that children are breaking being written up for and are getting away with while drivers continue to quit at a rapid pace due to lack of support and respect on their job. I urge MNPS to stand behind their drivers. Thank you for your time today. Good evening. Thank you for your attention. <clears throat> 
I've been here many times before. My name is Eric Warfield. I'm a proud MMPS school bus driver. MMPS transportation is a job heavy with responsibilities. MMPS school drivers are support employees, not the hired help. MMPS transportation has a fleet of employees dedicated to the job. Now the question, why is MMPS losing drivers at an all-time high and hard to replace them, needs to be looked at deeply. Pay and student discipline are top of the list. I'm here to talk about driver treatment on the job. All of transportation has things that need to be improved on. Drivers are asking to be heard and have some input about the job they do. We hold a Class B CDL license with two endorsements and a yearly renewed medical card. We drive in Nashville traffic with up to 84 students on a bus. That's three classrooms or exceptional students with mid to major medical, mental, or discipline issues that have been put off the regular ed buses. Driving our routes plus half or all of another route together or do it as an A, B, or C run. Work a split hour shift but can be called back to transportation on that four hour break which is your free time at the drop of a hat at their whim, at their call. Then you have the fact that we lost a 20-year bidding process where we could pick where we wanted to work as far as a route. Poof, gone. Just to be told where you will be placed. Drive on questionable snow days. One day you actually had to apologize for about two years ago. But the discretion that we were told to use on said snow day, some drivers were told to clock out, you won't get paid. But yet 20 CDL office employees sit in the office, not on the road, while children are standing in the cold waiting for a bus. When called, when called in on, made to feel that we are guilty first and an investigation done later. If, if nothing is found, a timeline is still kept. That information is kept for later. The one driver that the, uh, I'm sorry, excuse me. The drivers are told where we can't park buses where we get no help where to park. The one driver that's driving Dr. Joseph is a drop in the bucket for the hundred drivers. We are short. <laughs> drivers, drivers are not perfect. No one is. I have been driving for 27 years. No one knows my kids, my route better than me. That is no one in transportation running it or supervising it. <clears throat> I would, and if you're going to tell your drivers that they are a vital part of MNPS, then treat them like it. Right. We rather hear, <clears throat> we rather see a sermon than hear it any day. Right. If MNPS wants drivers to stay Mr. Warfield. and apply, please give them a reason to. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. to uh, Dr. Joseph, to Board Chair Dr. Gentry, to Board Vice Chair Ms. Bug, to District 2 member Ms. Elroyd, to District 3 member in her absent Ms. Spearing, and District 4 member in her absent Ms. Shepard, to District 6 member Ms. Bush, to District 7 member Mr. Pinkston, District 8 member Ms. Poopo Walker, and District 9 member Ms. Frode. My name is Barry Barlow, and I'm here tonight to request that you develop and use meeting norms. On January the 8th of this year, the Nashville community and I witnessed a very contentious board meeting. My observations led me to conclude that the school board should conduct itself in the same manner it requires others. I am a very involved parent. I'm blessed to serve on a number of the district's committees and parents' groups. It is through this work that I have become very familiar with the use and the success of using meeting norms, and meeting norms can be used to guide groups toward civility. Board policy one, 
1.1061, Article 5 and Section 1 says, I will support the full administrative authority as well as the responsibilities for the director of school to the properly discharge all professional duties. Article 6 and Section 2 says, I will avoid conflict of interest. I will refrain from using my position on the board for personal or partisan gain. Board Policy 1.101 under number four states, the board shall strive to provide the best educational opportunities possible for all children. On April the 18th, 1959, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. spoke to a group of young people. His concluding words to these youth were, whatever career you may choose for yourself, doctor, lawyer, teacher, let me propose an avocation to pursue along with it. Become a dedicated fighter for civil rights. Make it a central part of your life. It will make you a better doctor, a better lawyer, a better teacher. It will enrich you, it will enrich your spirit as nothing else possibly can. It will give you the rare sense of nobility that can only come from love and selfishly helping your fellow man. Make a career of humanity. Commit yourself to the noble struggle for equal rights. You will make a greater person of yourself, a greater nation of your country, and a final world to live in. I've brought each of you a gift tonight. It is a gift I came across while visiting one of the district's elementary schools. It is a poster that reads, to sell an argument, think about what is right, not who is right. If we are going to teach our children to get it right, then we adults need to get it right. I'm asking that you develop meeting norms for both your public and private meetings. Thanks for your time. I'm Barry Barlow, the president of the Parent Advisory Council for Metro Students. Thank, Thank you. you. And earlier, we have a new system for capturing those who want to speak in public participation. We had a conversation about this in one of our committee meetings, and part of the framework and guidelines for that new system was that if someone signed up at the cut after the cutoff, they were supposed to get a notice that says, you passed the deadline. Those notices did not go out. So we have three people who are here to speak. They received notices that they would be on the agenda, and so we're going to allow them to speak. Thank you, Madam Chair and board members, for this opportunity. I am a Nashvilleian. Parents were retired MNPS teachers. I am a product of MNPS and so are my children. Now my six-year-old and five-year-old grandchildren attend what I consider an outstanding school. I am the past chair of the report card committee, currently serve on the Alignment Nashville board. I am an assistant professor in the Department of Educational Leadership at TSU and on and on. I could continue with my accolades and accomplishments, but that's not why I'm here. It's not about me and it should not be. So why then is there an apparent tendency for a few board members to make it about them? Personal agendas, personal biases, and just plain nonsense as it relates to placing an unbelievable, unfair, and unjust amount of emphasis on our director of schools. I have sat back and watched this debacle play out for almost two years, and it is simply disheartening. While some of you or a few of you are intent on destroying this one man with every fiber of your being, there are thousands of children that are suffering every day, but there are also thousands of children that are doing great things. I am pleading with you as a board to get back to the business at hand, and that is ensuring that our children have what they need to graduate and be productive citizens. You see, we receive a few of those students uh, that graduate from your schools at TSU. And some of the challenges that they were dealing with throughout their matriculation are very evident on our campuses. I could care less if Dr. Joseph had a driver or a pilot. He's not stupid. I can't imagine him coming to Nashville and moving his family to fail at what he has committed his life's work to. And let's not play the taxpayer card. We know that our tax dollars are being spent on a lot of things that don't directly benefit us. So why are we so quick to bring it up? Let this man do his job. Yes, hold him accountable, but the pettiness is becoming an embarrassment to our city, to our state, and bottom line, the children are not benefiting from the foolishness. Teachers need more. I'm an educator on the college level, and the needs are much different, but at the end of the day, they need to survive just like each of us. We must advocate more for them. Good, bad, or indifferent, the cream always rises to the top. Pay is not the only motivator, but it is a good start. 
I may be preaching to the choir, so let's sing this song together, united and not divided. I read a quote today that said, you're not dysfunctional if you disagree, you're dysfunctional if you can't make a decision. Make the decision to do what is right today, that's all we have. Lastly, I wish to applaud you for supporting community partnerships. The schools cannot do it all. The areas that have been intentional about ensuring that the students and families have some level of support is appreciated, but there is more to be done. Take the politics out of this and allow the community partners to do what they do, such as exposing our students to global experiences. As I stated, I am a Nashvilleian and I am proud of it. I don't know how many of you sitting in front of me can say the same, but if you're not making the right decisions to ultimately benefit our kids and support the parents so that our communities will become stronger, then maybe you need to find something else to do or someone else to destroy. Disagreement can be healthy if it's done in the right environment. This right here, what we've been watching as a community is toxic and it is making us sick. Heal what you can, what you should, monitor the data, advocate for more funding, and let Sean Joseph Thank lead you. the district as you hired him to do. Thank you, Dr. Thank Wayne. you. Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the board and Dr. Joseph. Uh, my name is Keith Hargrove, and I come to you as an employee of Tennessee State University, president of a parent-teacher group organization, a STEM educator, and a single father of two very difficult, hard to understand teenagers. <laughs> uh, however, uh, in order to make a difference in creating and developing and preparing tomorrow's workforce in STEM, all hands on deck and a full court press is needed. Though there are many entities such as businesses, nonprofits, government are playing a role in addressing the STEM workforce challenge, we still have to do more. I represent a number of dedicated and committed faculty and staff at Tennessee State University that support the STEM initiatives and strategic goals of Dr. Sean Joseph, as well as some members of this board. For example, the College of, Engineer College of Education at TSU has a collaboration with NASA and the Metro Nashville Public School System for elementary and middle school kids for an aerospace academy. The program focuses on providing students in grades K through eight middle school, and STEM, with STEM education throughout the academic year. The product provides in-school and out-of-school STEM enrichment sessions. The in-school sessions are accomplished through monthly STEM days and partner elementary and middle school students. Currently, the project is collaborating with Neely's Bend Elementary, McKissick Middle, John Early Middle, and Ida B. Wells, and involves kids and families with outreach and family empowerment sessions. The problem-based curriculum includes learning pedagogies enriched with hands-on instructional strategies and an aerospace laboratory for technology, exposure to flight simulation, drones, robotics, coding, and virtual reality. In addition, the project offers a family empowerment sessions with workshops, a parent cafe, family night sessions, and an online cyber po portal accessible to parents and students. In addition, the College of Engineering at Tennessee State University has hosted the National Recognized Science Olympiad every year for more than 350 middle and high school students from Middle Tennessee in March, and has hosted the annual STEM Expo initiated by longtime educator Vicki Metzger to display creativity and science projects for middle and high school students, which more than 600 students attended. The College of Engineering also hosts a number of summer pre-college programs. These are only a few campus initiatives of Tennessee State University, and I want to commend Dr. Sean Joseph for being a strong advocate for these and a number of STEM initiatives at our university. Thank you for this opportunity and continue the good work. And is Davina Prager here? She was another um, who got a confirmation to speak. Thank you. So that ends public participation. We'll go into uh, governance issues, our organization. The consent agenda is as follows. 1A, recommended approval of request number five for purchase of playground equipment and installation services at Andrew Jackson Elementary School, Play World Preferred. 1B, recommended approval of request number six for rock removal during playground installation at Mount View Elementary School, Play World Preferred. 1C, recommended approval of supplement number two for New Hillwood High School, Hastings Architectural Associates, LLC. 1D, recommended approval of request for purchase of bleachers, Antioch Middle School football field bleacher replacement, Toad Vine Enterprises, Dan Clayton. 
1E, awarding of purchases and contracts. 1, Aspen Refrigerants, Inc. 2, Baker Distributing Co., LLC. 3, Border States Electric Su Supply, Harris Electric. 4, Business Systems and Consultants, Inc. 5, CDW Government, Inc. 6, Comfort Supply. 7, Data Blue, Inc. 8, Edmonds Engineering, Inc. 9, Ed Supply Company, Inc. 10, Ferguson Enterprises. 11, Internal Data Resources, Inc. 12, Johnstone Supply. 13, Mechanical Resource Group. 14, Municipal Auditorium. 15, Neely Cobble Com uh, Computer, Inc. 16, Parman Energy. 17, REA Parts, Inc. 18, Tech Systems, Inc. 20, Train. 21, Tyler Technologies, Inc. 1F, Special Course Adoptions. 1H, Legal Settlement Claim for $350,000. Madam Chair, I submit this consent agenda as read. Thank you. I have a motion to approve the agenda as read. Motion. So made. Second. Rachel said second. <laughs> <laughs> you have a discussion? Yeah, Madam Chair, I may have a conflict of interest on one of these, so I'm just going to uh, go on the record and abstain uh, okay. on this vote. Thank you. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. All right. So do we still need to do hands? Okay, so all in favor of the agenda as read, please raise your hand. Any opposed? So we have one, two, three, four, five, six approved, one abstain. All right. All right. Um, item number two under governance issues, anti voucher resolution. Yes, I'm bringing forth this resolution on behalf of my colleague, Ms. Anna Shepard, um, who's at home recovering. This is a resolution regarding vouchers for use in public schools in the state of Tennessee, and it reads, whereas the Metropolitan Nashville Board of Education is responsible for managing all public schools established or that may be established under its jurisdiction, whereas there is pending le legislation before the Tennessee General Assembly that would create a voucher program allowing students to use public education funds to pay for private school tuition, voucher programs are also known as opportunity scholarships, education savings, tax credits or similar terms, and whereas proponents have spent millions to convince the public and lawmakers of their efficacy, yet more than five decades after introduction, vouchers remain controversial, unproven, and unpopular, and whereas the Constitution of the State of Tennessee requires that the Tennessee General Assembly provide for the maintenance, support, and eligibility standards of a system of free public schools, and whereas the State of Tennessee has established nationally recognized standards and measures for accountability in public education, and whereas vouchers eliminate accountability by channeling, tax, by channeling taxes to private schools without the same, academic or testing requirements, public budgets or reports on student achievement, open meetings and records law adherence, public accountability requirements in major federal laws, including special education laws, and whereas vouchers have not been effective at improving student achievement or closing the achievement gap, and whereas vouchers leave students behind, including those with the greatest needs, because vouchers channel tax dollars into private schools that are not required to accept all students, nor offer the, offer the special services they may need, and whereas underfunded public schools are less able to attract and retain teachers, and whereas vouchers give choices to private entities rather than to parents and students, since the providers decide whether to accept vouchers, how many and which students to admit, and potentially are arbitrary reasons they might dismiss a student, and whereas the Metropolitan Nashville Board of Education provides numerous academic choices, community schools, magnet, STEM, international baccalaureate, career technical programs, academies of Nashville, adv advanced placement, et cetera, and has a robust school cho choice policy which allows students to attend others in the district, and whereas vouchers divert critical funds from public schools to pay private school tuition for a few students, including those who already attend private schools, and whereas vouchers are inefficient, compelling taxpayers to support two school systems, one public and one private, the latter of which is not accountable to all taxpayers taxpayer supporting it, 
Therefore, be it resolved that the Metropolitan Nashville Board of Education opposes any legislation or other similar effort to create a voucher program in Tennessee that would divert, divert money intended for public education to private entities. Be it further resolved that a copy of this resolution shall be delivered to the governor, each member of the Tennessee General Assembly, the Metropolitan Nashville Mayor and Council, and Vice Mayor. Adopted by the elected Metropolitan Nashville Board of Education, meeting in regular session on the 12th of February, 2019, with this resolution to take immediate effect, the public welfare requiring it. Okay. You've heard the resolution. Is there a motion? <laughs> motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. All right. Any further discussion? And by a show of hands, all in favor of the resolution as read? It's unanimous. Okay, well, we got you. All right, I just want to make sure. <laughs> make sure. <laughs> Thank you. Now vote twice. Thank you. Thank you. Only in Chicago, I hear. <laughs> all right, and now we're on to surplus a portion of the Hope Park property from Budget Committee. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I just skipped all over that. I'm so sorry. I drew a line through it and everything. Okay, relocation of East Nashville Magnet Middle School. Sorry. Ms. Bugs. I move to relocate. Oh. <laughs> Anybody else want to talk about this? I move to relocate East Middle School back <laughs> to East High School. Uh, okay, there's a motion to accept the recommendation to relocate East Nashville Magnet <coughs> Middle School back to its previous location. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion or any information that the district would like to share, administration would like to share? Mr. Pinkston. No, I just wanted to thank the administration and Dr. Joseph and his team for handling this the right way. I mean, I haven't been had total visibility into it the way Ms. Bugs has, but the fact that you know we're not under siege about this vote, I think, says something about the way it's been handled. Handled. So thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, if you don't mind, I, absolutely. Again, for the viewing public, just to give you some background. Um, we do have a budget deficit that we're trying to make up in this past year. Mayor Briley asked us to consider consolidating schools just to free up some funding. So uh, in September of 2018, East High School lost a guidance counselor. They had to lose their senior guidance counselor. Teachers were frustrated, parents were frustrated, students were incredibly frustrated. They re reached out to administration and administration responded very quickly. They um, came to a PTO meeting, they answered questions, they didn't dodge any questions, and the question was raised pretty much by the parents there, what could they do to increase funding for their school? We began talking about a potential consolidation because East Middle School parents had also asked what could they do to get more funding and resources into their school. Um, I wasn't on the board, so I'm not privy to every uh, conversation around why the two schools were split initially a few years ago, but all this recommendation is is to, to put those schools back on the same campus, the Gallatin High, I mean the Gallatin campus, I mean the Gallatin Street campus, uh, the East High School campus, It'll be in a separate building, as Councilman Withers stated, in the two meetings that we had with PTO and administrators and parents, um, they had a few logistical questions, but I feel very confident, and the parents that left that night felt very confident in what would happen with their students moving forward. So just wanted to give some history to make sure that everybody understands we did reach out to the community. The com community was extremely responsive and receptive to this. They know that it will benefit their students, and we'll be working with them over the coming months to help facilitate that move. Thank you. Any other discussion? Any other comments? <coughs> All right. We'll call for the vote. All in favor of approving the relocation of East Nashville Magnet Middle School? Raise your hands. It's unanimous. Anyone opposed? Nope. Thank you. All right. Now, can we talk about the? Yes. So we struck that one. So the surplus uh, portion of the Hope Pro Park property, uh, from Budget Committee, I refer to, defer to Mr. Pinkston. Yeah, um, I'd like to make a motion that uh, we surplus uh, a certain uh, portion of property at Hope Park in uh, Bellevue and Ms. Frog's district to uh, Metro Parks, which has uh, expressed interest in turning it into future green space uh, for that part of the county. So uh, that's my motion. Motion, is there a second? I'll second it and then I would like to amend the motion. Okay. Okay. So the motion that I made on the floor, just to clarify, was uh, I moved to transfer the portion of the Hope Park land that is not used for the high school uh, for transfer to the Metro uh, to Metro Parks, subject to the Parks Board approval to accept the land. Gotcha. Second. Right. Okay. So we have a. Okay. Stay with me. Let me. 
let, let me, um, just in the interest of clarity, can I restate the original motion to mirror uh, what she did? Well, we can actually just go ahead and vote her amendment motion and then vote your motion down. Got it, got it. And just call it that way. Got right. It. So we have a motion and a second. So all in favor of the motion as stated by Ms. Frobe, let's show our hands. Okay, it proposed, uh, passes unanimously. Now going back to the original motion for Ms. I rescind, Z, you can I rescind, rescind the earlier yeah. motion. All right, here we go. Let's see how you say that one. Can I get an applause, just a thumbs up or something, whatever? Come, thank you. Please. Robert's rules, Robert's rules, very good. <laughs> All right, and now we're on to the director's report. Thank you, uh, Mark Swan, the director of Metro Internal Audit is here to give us an update. Uh, we constantly monitor our business processes uh, to be sure uh, we are efficient and that our business is above board and beyond reproach. <laughs> and we appreciate the independent monitoring uh, from Metro Internal Audit. I think we should take all allegations of improper behavior seriously, and I appreciate the board's genuine desire to ensure that we are following proper processes and procedures as it relates to our procurement practices. Audits allow us to understand what happened, and more importantly, it gives us an opportunity to correct any issues or any potential issues. Uh, the audit recommendations will be acted upon with a sense of urgency and due diligence. In fact, our team has already started uh, the work towards implementing the recommendations. Uh, prior to turning the microphone over to Mr. Swan, I'd like to reflect upon the context of this audit and the recent flurry of audits that have been called for in recent months, because all leadership actions are always influenced by context. In May of 2016, when I started as your director, I heard from many people. People actually sent me dozens of letters uh, at my previous work location sharing what they described as a climate of fear. Uh, they were seeking a willing, listening ear and a commitment to work to address some of our challenges in this area. What I know from my experience in working in three other school districts and my work with different school districts around the country is that one source of fear is change, and changing culture just takes time. Nationally, we've seen how destructive fear can be in the day-to-day -day lives of good people. For example, our government was shut down, and we are on the brink of a second shutdown uh, because, because of an alleged fear of immigrants entering our country and doing harm uh, to American citizens. Last year, uh, in Oakland, California, we witnessed how men barbecuing at a park evoked fear in, in someone to the point where she frantically called the police to do something about them. Uh, similarly, in Philadelphia, uh, two men seeking to use a restroom and waiting for an acquaintance to conduct business at a local Starbucks were taken away in handcuffs by police officers. And most tragically, it was nearly seven years ago uh, that we saw a 17-year-old wearing a sweatshirt with a hoodie and a pocket full of Skittles tragically shot due to a heightened sense of fear. What we know is that fear is a mind killer. It is a, little, it is a little evil that disintegrates us from inside out. And in fact, we must learn to face and control our fears. So we're fortunate to have Mark Swan here uh, to help us dispel some of the fears uh, that we have had as it relates to our procurement practices. Unintentional human errors have been made, processes have been changed, and people have been working hard to get things right for our 85,000 students. This past Friday, we lost a great man in the city, and uh, Dr. Gentry spoke uh, to some of the things that uh, he had done for us. You know, uh, David Williams was not only a friend to Nashville, uh, but he was a friend to Metro Nashville Public Schools. Uh, as you know, he was the former Vice Chancellor of Vanderbilt University, and he recently reminded me that Nashville is a place where people are willing to come together to collectively find solutions to problems. He always encouraged me to never let fear drive my actions. It is with this advice uh, that we will come together and welcome uh, the audit and the audit's findings, and we'll continue to uh, embrace those findings and implement uh, the actions. Uh, 
Uh, because we're in Asheville, and fear will never control our actions, not in our city and not in our school system. Uh, we'll continue to encourage staff, parents, and students to reach out to us if you ever have a concern. Uh, we will always respond to your inquiries, and we will always listen to find collaborative solutions to our greatest challenges. It is in this spirit of collaboration, civility, and respect for Mr. Swan and the dozens of employees who have spent countless hours over the course of almost a year responding to these in inquiries uh, that we now should respect their professional work and accept the responses they have provided uh, through vetting them and providing them here tonight. As our children from Pearl Cone High School recently reminded us in their musical uh, creation uh, behind the mask, we can and should come together in a civil way, be respectful and sensitive of the different perspectives and backgrounds that exist, and model for them how to respectfully disagree while still collaborating uh, and providing them the excellent education and the positive role model that they deserve. Uh, so at this time, I will turn the microphone over to Mark Swan, Director of Metro's Office of Internal Audit. Thank you for the school board members. Um, we appreciate the opportunity to be able to present um, our investigation report. Uh, we received a series of allegations through our hotline and from individuals who came to our office of different, uh, what we consider to be a theme of procurement improprieties. And so we kind of collected all those together and they just kept adding up vendor after vendor, procurement after procurement. Uh, and so we tried to summarize all those allegations, and they came up with approximately 18 different allegations that um, we believe needed to be further investigated. Um, however, when we did, I know I can talk very broadly, is that the majority of those allegations we believe they didn't have, uh, were substantive enough to be considered to be inappropriate um, behavior for mismanagement of, I don't, I hate to use the word fraud, but uh, in the, the inappropriate use of resources. Um, and so there were situations where Dr. Joseph had mentioned where the procurement method was being questioned. Should it have been sole source? Was it justified or not? And in most of those situations, there was cooperative purchases being done or an emergency purchase was being declared. And the the testimonial evidence or other documents we saw seemed to justify that. There was one contract that did use an out-of-state um, cooperative purchase, um, which that's been in the press. You know, and I can tell you from the my training at the municipal uh, municipal CM, the certified municipal finance officers training, they list five or six different ways for cooperative purchases and using out-of-state buying associations but you have to when you look at all that code it's kind of hard to tell um and so however we did the allegation wasn't on that particular vendor was not about the uh, was it done outside or not it was more on what the purchases were for um but we mentioned that in our discussion and analysis we have recommendations to help ensure that they're following the right procedures there's proper documentation for federal grant money when uh, sole source is being used um, when consultants are being used. Um, and so I'll leave it at that. Um, you know, I guess the main thing is saying there were situations where not every I was dotted, not every T was crossed, but the substance of the purchase, was it justified for sole purchase or they used a competitive cooperative agreement was there. And so. I'll leave for any questions that you may have. Because this is my second board meeting today, so I'm kind of. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Um, I don't have questions, but I did have a statement that I wanted to read. Um, Hold on one, one second before you get to your statement. Okay. Does anyone have any questions for, for, for Mr. Swan, specifically for him? So, I mean, I'm not going to make you stand here. Study. You don't have to leave. I'm here room, as long as you need me. But you know, if you want to sit down and take a seat and be comfortable until you have to come back to the podium, just feel free to do that. Ms. Rowe. Okay. All right. News Channel 5 put out a series of stories last week. 
which revealed new information not addressed by our audit. I'd like to summarize the information from these stories, which is all documented in great detail online by reporter Phil Williams. Prior to his arrival in Nashville, the director had a pre-existing relationship with Performance Matters and its representatives. He appeared in a promotional video for the company and as a keynote speaker at one of their conferences. Before he started his job here, the director began discussions with Performance Matters about getting contracts into Nashville. Only weeks after arriving, the director was pushing employees to buy Performance Matters products. The district did so without allowing for, op for an open bidding process. Multiple employees reported that they were being forced to buy these products at inflated prices, even though MMPS did not need them and would not use them. MMPS employees allege that representatives from Performance Matters told them, we are friends with your superintendent and you are getting these products whether you want them or not. The RFP bidding process is in place to ensure we get the best price and to protect against fraud and abuse, but we did not follow it in this case. MNPS awarded Performance Matters two no-bid contracts. The director awarded the first no-bid contract for a million dollars in violation of state law, which the director has admitted. It was piggybacked on an out-of-state contract, which is illegal, and the terms of the original contract changed, which is also illegal. These are the first two violations of state law to put in no-bid no contracts. We do not know how that $1 million was spent because the district maintains it has no usage records. <clears throat> MNPS awarded a second no-bid contract to Performance Matters, also illegally. Again, the terms of the piggyback contract were changed, which is a third violation of state law. The terms of this no-bid contract are nowhere near competitive. The cost under Performance Matters I'm sorry, the cost of services under Performance Matters has more than doubled the cost of our previous services, which grew from $6,250 a month to $12,862 a month. On top of this, we paid a setup fee of $118,000 to buy the Performance Matters product and $500,000 to Certica Solutions to provide items for the Performance Matters system. Nevertheless, many employees continue to use our pre-existing services. The News Channel 5 reports also show that the director misled the board to get these contracts in place. He told us we did not have time for a formal bidding process to engage in open and competitive bidding for the software to track professional development. Internal MNPS documentation reveals this was not true. The news report also shows that the director changed the term of the contract that we approved. We approved a two-year contract, but the director signed a three-year contract. The director explained this discrepancy on the board floor by saying that our purchasing director just went off on his own and negotiated new contract terms without telling his boss, Chris Henson. This stands in direct contradiction to the audit's findings, finding that the discrepancy in contract amounts was not intentional. Finally, the administration promised this board that if we approved the third year of this contract, it would be put out for bids this fall. That never happened, and we have not been presented a plan for how we are going to continue tracking professional development without extending this no-bid contract with Performance Matters. But it doesn't end there. The director gave another no-bid million-dollar contract to Education Solution Services for substitute teachers. This contract was illegally piggybacked from a contract in Wilson County. Not only did we lose the volume savings by piggybacking on a contract from a smaller county, but the director also changed the terms of the contract, which is a fourth violation of state law. The original contract for $1 million went over the spending limit and ballooned to $1.25 million by the end of the term. Although we claimed we needed to piggyback the contract to ensure a low price, we are actually paying more than Wilson County for the same services which, again, is in violation of state law. Only months after MNPS officials admitted to the board that the cost of the ESS services had spiraled out of control, we chose to give them another no-bid contract, this time for $2.5 million. This contract is for cafeteria assistance, but as it turns out, the Wilson County contract doesn't provide for cafeteria assistance. We are piggybacking non-existent services in this case a fifth violation of state law. The director claimed on the board floor in 2018 that we must use piggybacking to get the best price, 
But as you can see, we are getting a worse price with all of these contracts. Piggybacking has been used to increase prices, not lower them. So why is all of this important? Superintendents have been sent to prison for giving no-bid contracts in exchange for personal benefit. One such superintendent is Dallas Stance, formerly of Baltimore County Schools. When he interviewed for this job, Dr. Joseph claimed Dallas Stance as his mentor, and after he was hired, Dr. Joseph brought Dance to Nashville as an advisor on the transition team. Only months after serving as an advisor here in Nashville, Dallas Dance was convicted of using the piggyback method to steer no-bid contracts to vendors in exchange for kickbacks. These news stories are not something to be taken lightly, and these issues arose after we called for the audit. These are very serious reports. I'm asking every board member to please do your homework and carefully review the documentation on the News Channel 5 website. The news reports clearly lay out how our board was misled and show that our procurement practices were improper, unethical, and in violation of both state law and board policy. It's laid out in black and white through the numerous emails that transpired between our employees, which are all posted on the News Channel 5 website. Please study the emails that demonstrate evidence of wrongdoing behind our backs. Then, last night, Phil Williams aired another story, sh story excuse me, showing that our chief academic officer failed to disclose consulting fees from Education Research De and Development Institute, ERDI, a company through which the district is awarding contracts. I raised concerns about consulting fees from ERDI back in June because an ethics board in another state found that ERDI's practices are unethical. When I raised the issue, the director was not truthful with the board. As it turns out, the director's mentor, Dallas Stance, also got into trouble by failing to disclose consulting fees from ERDI. MNPS is doing business with numerous ERDI-affiliated companies with whom Dr. Joseph's team has signed contracts for more than $17 million. Um, I'll just pause here and note that this afternoon, the Metro Audit Committee voted unanimously not to accept the MNPS audit pending further time for review. Um, but I do want to address a few issues and concerns that I do have about the audit. Number one, the audit report concludes that the awarding of a $1 million no-bid contract with Performance Matters for computer-related services was not illegal because state law exempts consulting services. This appears to contradict state law, which requires competitive bidding for information technology services. Number two, the audit report suggests that Sorry, that an $845,000 contract with Performance Matters for professional development software was properly piggybacked on a Shelby County contract, even though a comparison of the two contracts shows that MNPS renegotiated the terms of the deal. State law prohibits changing contract terms on, terms on a piggyback contract as a way to avoid competitive bidding. Number three. The audit does not address the fact that the administration admitted to News Channel 5 that it signed a million dollar student assessment contract, then did not actually require any school systems to utilize the service. MMPS was not able to document if the service was ever used by the district. Number four, the audit does not address the fact that the school board was misled by the administration about the urgent need for a non-competitive contract with Performance Matters even though News Channel 5 published an email that shows that situation had been resolved before a contract was presented to the board. News Channel 5 documented other areas where the board was misled. Number five, the audit does not address a report by News Channel 5 that the administration claimed it was piggybacking two contracts, one for 1.25 million, the other for 2.5 million with Helton Management Group, Education Solution Services, ESS Southeast, on a contract with a smaller school system, Wilson County Schools, then it renegotiated the deal to pay the company a higher price. Number six, auditors say it was unsubstantiated that the administration tried to execute a $1 million contract with Scholastic following a trip to Amelia Island, but the report goes on to describe that exact scenario and explains that the effort failed after questions were raised by Vice Chair Jill Spearing. Number seven, the audit does not address the educational credentials of consultant Bruce Taylor and exactly how he came to receive contracts totaling over $105,000 without board approval in violation of board policy. Number eight, 
The audit appears to gloss over the fact that Chief Academic Officer Monique Felder failed to properly disclose consulting fees received from Education Research and Development Institute until after questions were raised by the board and our auditors in 2018. Number nine, the audit does not address the fact that Dr. John, Dr. Sean Joseph's contract allows him to, quote, continue with ownership of Joseph and Associates LLC, end quote, but there is no specific requirement that he disclose income or sources of income received through that LLC. And number 10, the audit reports that research for better teaching had been paid $172,161, but only reviewed $147,858 of those expenditures in determining whether the administration violated <laughs> MNPS rules requiring board approval for contracts of $100,000 or more. The audit ignores documents published by News Channel 5 showing that MNPS was operating off an agreement that had been signed by R RBT, Research for Better Teaching, but that was never presented to the school board. The administration attached those agreements to unauthorized purchased request forms. UPRs. The audit does not answer why the administration produced a draft contract and then decided not to present it to the board for approval. And I just want to say my purpose here is not to attack the auditors or any of that process, but these are very serious questions that have come to light mostly after the News Channel 5 reports. And I will just close by saying that I think MNPS needs an independent investigation into all of these very serious allegations. Any other comments? Um, uh, Mr. Swan, I'm sorry. Um, now that you are aware, you're aware of the Metro decision, right? The Metro audit decision to bring it yes, back? Uh, yes, yeah. Okay. Well, what are your next, um, what, what's going to happen next now that it has not been accepted? Well, it's, it's just deferred to our next meeting and the decision is to have a meeting in March. So. And what kind of process happens during that time? Um, we'll probably just wait till. The, well, one thing we'll be making a request from Dr. Joseph to get a reply to the recommendations on a corrective action plan. Um, in addition to that, um, you know, one of the things I will try to make sure this was an investigation, not an audit. An audit would encompass a lot more work, a lot more assurance <coughs> services. These were specific allegations that we're giving, and we targeted on those specific allegations. A lot of what you're talking about does not relate to these specific allegations. And uh, on performance matters, a lot of that was that we already had a data warehouse, and we bought another data warehouse. That was the allegation, not how it was procured or anything like that. And you know, from our research, <coughs> our testimonial evidence and work, that there's nowhere in the contract that describes in performance matters that they're buying a data warehouse. Um, and that there was no intention to replace the data warehouse, the existing data warehouse. So that was the allegation, and that was our, we say it was unsubstantiated. Um, so the question from there is how we'll just wait and see from that. But we'll be asking, I was waiting to present today to, we will issue our reports, then we ask for a corrective action plan, and then we'll have issue a revised report on the corrective action plan. And and we'll determine if we need to do more work. Does that answer your question? I think so. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm still wrapping my head around all of this. So as colleagues, as a school board, it is our job, yes, to support the director, to question the director, to oversee, to manage, to review contracts before we sign off on them, to have robust discussions. And at no point do I want one of my colleagues to feel attacked. I do want us all to feel supported in doing our job and managing the director. But I, my goal is to always try to be solution oriented. You know, what is our next step? What is our goal? How, how would we rectify this? So. As I've told you in public and private, I appreciate you asking questions and doing the research, but then what are our next steps? So when we have a budget or a governance or a director's evaluation committee meeting, what is it that we can do to A, become a functioning board again, and B, either 
support the director, better oversee or have better discussions? Just, I mean, what do we do to make sure that our students are getting the best of us and that the decisions that we make around this table, the contracts that we procure, the the resources that we fight for, that the way that we advocate to the city for the funding that we need to actually implement the procurement processes appropriately, what, what do those next steps look like? What would you need from us? What, like, what happens next? So you've laid out more allegations. I mean, is it that you would prefer to have another audit or to have a deeper investigation? Is you know, just what what would your what would your ask of us be? I think that we need a deeper investigation. Again, it needs to be a fully independent source, but I think we need an investigation. <coughs> okay, so are you might you are you suggesting or are you moving that we put out an RFP for another investigation? Let me just no. Let me just table this until the next meeting um, and just bring a notice that I would like an investigation, um, I will figure out how to best ask for that at the next meeting. But you'll actually have to bring notice at the next meeting. It's not on the agenda. Okay, I'll bring notice then, at the then next you meeting. you more time to okay. figure out what your process is gonna be. Anyone else? I'll say, that, this is the thing. I So I know we all have gotten calls and emails and questions from the community, and I do feel like a, a, for much of this past year, we've tried to be head down doing the work. And even when there are allegations, we've tried to let the auditors take care of it. And I think our silence has been misinterpreted. It's not that we've been silent. We've continued to do work. But I, there's just there's there's so much here that I, I want us to be able to fix as a board to just be... Um, to be better at doing our job and better at being a functioning board, as I said before, but I also don't want the community to just think that nothing is happening or that we aren't having continuous meetings and that we aren't supporting our students in our schools. And I, I'm at a point where I, I kind of just don't know what to say. I was really excited for this audit to come out for this report because I was hoping that one way or the other we would be done with some of these conversations and be ready to move forward as a district because we are in the midget of the middle of budget season and I don't care what anyone says the 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 council members that I am talking to, and yes, I am still trying to meet with all 38 of them, those council members are using the dysfunction of the board or what they believe is a dysfunctional board as their reason for not fully funding us. They are pulling some of the allegations or just some of the um, some of the news stories. I mean, they're, they're using these as reasons to not fund us. And at the end of the day, that's my biggest concern. But I just, I hope that we can move through this quickly and yes, amicably, and then be able to just get the funding that we need because the more I read through this audit, the more I read through what we were given by Bone McAllister, it do, we are just under-resourced. And I'm sorry, I'll stop there. I just, I look but forward to, to whatever yeah, we'll have next. I just hope that we can be solution-oriented moving forward. Can I speak? Thank you. Um, I hear you. I definitely hear you. We are in crisis mode right now with all these contracts that we're up against as far as breaking the law and the fraudulent um, uh, processes that, that have been taken. Uh, I mean, the council is not just looking at, looking at us as a board doing this. It's our, 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 our superintendent. That's, that's not on us. He has every opportunity to get this right and do right. But now we're up against a, up, our backs up are, are up against the wall now because now we are dealing with a situation that is, it's not good. So we've been put in in the middle of this. So, what else do we do? What else do we do? I mean, we didn't do this. I'm disappointed. I'm embarrassed as a district, as a board member. I get you, I get what you're saying, but what are we supposed to do? This is not our problem. This is an administration problem, and this is a superintendent problem. This is not a race issue. This is a problem that we have. So that's what we have to address. If some of those Metro Council members that are on this board, on this committee, that are rejecting this audit, there is a reason why. We have nothing to do with that. 
And if we need to have a third party investigation done that takes us out of the loop, that's probably what we need to do so we can get those answers. Because these are allegations, so we probably need to go through that process. So I will say that um, the goal here should be continuous improvement, right? And so if we have investigations conducted or audit or – so this, I'm going to be clear. This is not an audit. This is just an investigation. investigation. Okay. So I guess we've been calling it an audit. Have we not been calling it an audit? Audit. Okay. <laughs> I was confused. Uh, but is not the goal here to look at what's happening, learn, improve, change, grow? much like a conversation about teachers um, trying to raise money, right? Much like any other process where we are trying to um, solve problems, trying to lead. I fundamentally disagree. This is all our problem, right? This dysfunction and this conflict and this sort of nonstop need for, um, I don't know, um, just constantly kind of questioning and um, and I'm not saying the questions aren't warranted I'm not saying I'm not arguing that findings were not truthful what I'm saying is you could investigate a, an organization this big into eternity and so I, I think we have to decide is our goal here to to learn is it that we need to do better monitoring is it I, I, I don't know what the as, as a teacher, as a, somebody who's believing in restorative practices, like what's the lesson we're learning here? Uh, can we learn from this process, right? And can we move forward in a way that inspires confidence? And so fundamentally disagree. This is all of us. We are all responsible for this. And, and so we all have to solve it together. And I just want to add, and hopefully we can move past this, it's not the what that's causing us the problem, it's the how. Um, it's just the blatant disrespect that comes along with the comments. And I will say that tonight has probably been probably the most respectful that this table has been in a very, very long time. There hasn't been finger wagging, there hasn't been name calling, um, and it's, it's been a long time since we've, we've been there. And so if there are questions or concerns, they're valid, but what we, no but, period. We need to, to, to get everyone comfortable or get to a point where we can actually just move forward. But I want to say that, you know, we have to just be very careful with the how because there is somebody that's sitting there thinking that if, if the investigation from Mark Swan had come back with 9,000 things wrong and being able to tie a name to every mistake, we wouldn't be on the second level of digging deeper. And if it comes back and, you know, I heard words like kickback and his crony. And again, we love the inflammatory language. We love the sound bites. We love the things that can come out in a tweet. And I'm going to, I hope y'all stay through the comments because I have something I just, it's on my heart to share. Um, but it just, it always seems as though it's never enough. It's never enough to say, here are the problems, we need to fix it, and we are collectively going to be partners in finding solutions and moving forward. And I think that that's fundamentally what people want and what people are expecting and what our students and teachers and, and everyone else and bus drivers and cafeteria workers and everybody deserves from us. And that's all I'm asking, is that we get to the point where we own our part in this and we keep you know finding things and digging things and you know when the investigative journalist becomes the voice of authority at the board table it's that's just bizarre to me it's just absolutely bizarre. maybe just me it's just absolutely bizarre to me um, but this is where we are and so mrs. Frog, I would ask that you be prepared to um, just add to the agenda or if make sure we get it added to the agenda and cameo keep me honest and David when we get to agenda planning make sure we add the notice of uh, the request or whatever the next the step is so we need to talk through that um, Ms. Frog to figure out make sure we get the steps laid out um, to get us moving forward um, but the work has to continue work has to continue and life has to go on and um, <coughs> You know, I think, I don't know if it was in the Pearl Cone video or something that alluded to the fact that fundamentally we are all still very human um, in, this, in this space and in this work. And uh, I would just ask everybody to do know what you need to do to stay whole and stay functional. Um, yes. Okay. So let me, I just want to respond to a few things. First of all, 
I am capable of thinking for myself. Um, this is not the voice of Phil Williams that's speaking. I've been raising these concerns since last year, so I first raised these April 11th. Nobody on the board asked me a question about them except Jill Spearing. I mean, I've been raising these for a long time. Um, I'm kind of astounded that this board would sit here and turn a blind eye to multiple allegations of breaking the law, breaking our board policy, and the director being fully untruthful to the board. And so all this is documented on News Channel 5. If, if you don't believe me, go and look. There are all of the emails from our um, employees versus what was said on the board, and I'm asking you all to, to review that because it shows that there is a pattern of dishonesty with the board. It, it has been going on for years now, and that is why we are having dysfunction. And um, and I and I I just I, I these are these are new allegations. This is not just continuing to dig up the same problems. These are pretty shocking allegations, apparently to the rest of the city. I don't understand why the board is not reacting at all. And, um, I, I, and I wish I had this quote in front of me, but um, when Reverend Barber was here, he, he said um, that unity is not sitting around and just being unified to, for unification's sake. It is standing up for what you believe is right. And I am standing up because I believe that money in this district is being mismanaged that should be going to classrooms and to children. And we need to get to the truth of that. It's not about personality. It's not about um, being unwilling to accept uh, a, a verdict by the auditor. The auditor said tonight they didn't have a lot of these allegations. But this is serious, and I'm just asking the board to take it seriously. And that's why I would like to have an, an independent investigation. Ms. Bugs. Um, so I just have to keep us honest here. I know I was a month after having my first child and I saw the board meeting on, I was watching it with the rest of the community, saw these different allegations and my first, the, the very first thing I did was reach out to you, Amy. My very first thing, I called you, I emailed you and Dr. Severe and I said, Dr. Severe, if these are questions that my colleague has, would you mind giving me a list of them, helping me? Because I wanted to be able to dig in and do my own research. I made sure to reach out to you to get point, you know, to, to get clarity for my sake. And the more we talked, the more I understood that you were frustrated, and I, I got that, and that you wanted us to oversee and manage the director, and I understood that also. But where I started to lose, um, lose my connection with you was when some of the allegations would turn up to not be, I, I, would, I wasn't provided the appropriate context. One of the allegations that was thrown out was that Dr. Joseph's travel budget was overspent by 300%. And I remember being, I'll be honest, I was so frustrated by that. Like, where has this man been traveling? What has he, where has he gone on these taxpayer dimes that it's overspent this much? And then I dig more, I ask more questions, and I come to find out that his travel budget is overspent not by him traveling, but by board members traveling. So I was frustrated that I was given a piece of information. It was truthful, but there was no context. And here I was ready to hold him accountable for something he was not responsible for. And so it was then that I began to kind of lose, not respect for you or, or anything like that, but I began to kind of question where the frustrations were coming from because I, I just didn't, I couldn't see the connections. So I. Again, I want you to understand that, yes, you should be asking questions. I fully support that. And I, if, if, an, if a second investigation will make us more comfortable moving forward or even having more robust conversations, then I'm fine with that also. But as your colleague, I just have to say that I personally would like for us to have all of the facts before we're ready to burn him at the stake. I want to have all the facts before we go to the before we go to the council and the mayor and make requests for the budget, and then they question us and we don't provide them the appropriate context for either allegations that we've made or for facts that have not been fa that have not been found to be factual. So, I, again, I, I appreciate the work that that each of us do on this board, but. 
I don't want anyone to think or for a sound bite to be taken. Because, I mean, I'll be honest, I don't, I don't watch Channel 5. So I just, I haven't seen some of these. I'm a Channel 2 kind of gal. So I don't want any of these sound bites to float out there and the community believe that we're not believing our, uh, or we're not working together or we're just ignoring allegations because that's not the case. But when I hear an allegation, I do kind of give it the big eye now because I want to make sure I have all the facts. So uh, these different allegations that you've set up you know, I'll reach out to Dr. Severe if you don't mind, and we can start to kind of build this list and whatever your next steps will be, I look forward to that. And I am ready to have that conversation, but that, I just can't let that sound bite just float out there on its own without context. All right, thank you. I'd like to move into announcements. We'll start with Ms. Frog. Do you have any other I was nuggets just, you'd like to share? I was just going to celebrate Dr. Gleason tonight, who has already been celebrated. So just want to thank her for her service to Harpeth Valley and our district. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Walker? Uh, I wanted to celebrate all of our amazing school counselors. Last week was School Counseling Week. We love our school counselors um, and appreciate all they do every day for our students. I also want to personally um, send a lot of love to Gail Williams and to her family. Um, thinking about her all the time, they were members of my district, supporters of me, um, great counsel to me personally, um, huge admirer of David Williams, and it's a huge loss. I have a few announcements. Uh, I would like for everyone to be excited that Read Me Week is coming yes. up. We are yes, two, yes, weeks, yes, two yes. weeks away. It begins <laughs> February 25th. If you have 30 minutes to an hour, maybe not even that long, 30 minutes to spend at an area school, please visit. Call the guidance counselors there. They will be excited to have you come and read to one of their students, or to one of their students' classes. That's right. Uh, the TSSAA basketball season is still underway. Championships begin this week, I believe. And I will say District 5 has a number of great basketball teams, both girl and boy. So find the schedule um, at your area school. Please go out and support those students as, as they make their, as they vie for the state championship title. Um, Mondays at Stratford High School from 1155 to 1245. I really want to thank Vanderbilt professors, STEAM professors for going up there to top floor. We rotate. I was up there last Monday. I'll be up there next Monday. Um, if you wouldn't mind coming to volunteer as a math, science, or STEM tutor, those students at, at Stratford would love to have you. Uh, the MNPS Equity and Diversity Summit is coming up next week. I'm so sorry I don't have the date in front of me, but the 18th, I'm sorry. So please visit the website, sign up. Um, Belmont Community Night, they will be this Thursday. They have a game. Please come out at 6 o'clock. Uh, I will be hosting community meetings to both hear from the community and to present some information around the budget. We have not received this, this, this next year's budget, but we will be talking to the community members about that. So Tuesday, February 19th at Lachlan Design Center, Thursday, February 24th at Martin Luther King uh, Magnet School, immediately following their PTO meeting, Thursday, February 28th at Stratford High School. I have some in March, but I'll wait to give you all those dates just so I don't overwhelm you. Thank you so much. And that wasn't overwhelming. Was. That was overwhelming. Ms. Elrod. You know I do. All right, so Cole Elementary had a school-wide assembly the morning of Friday, February the 8th for Bookham, and Haywood Elementary is on Monday, March the 1st. I very much hate that I had to miss Cole's assembly, but will be in attendance of Haywood's, and of course, if you have not signed up to participate at either the school, there's two other schools that are also having assemblies to read, please do so. Um, I personally fondly remember my uh, Bookham button that I won many personal pan pizzas with. <laughs> so I love Bookham for many reasons. Uh, two, I have congratulations to Overton's library, Jennifer, Sh or librarian, excuse me, uh, Jennifer Sharp. She will be the president of the Tennessee Association of School Librarians. Also on Saturday, January 26th, of course, this is all about the Overton train. Overton hosted MMPS's first Science Olympiad Invitational. Uh, lots of participating groups and over 200 students attended the event, competing in over dozens of contests throughout the day. And the teams are going to compete in regionals at the end of this month at TSU. On Thursday the 31st, the Legacy Mission Village, which is Overton's partner in after-school programming for refugees, opened a computer lab in the community room of an apartment complex that houses a lot of our immigrant families in that district and in our cluster. Overton's corporate partner, which is Comcast, agreed, or one of theirs, which is Comcast, agreed to fund the lab to benefit all of the families and students within our cluster. 
And then also regarding Overton on February 15th. So if you want to grab your Valentine, please do so. And come on over to Overton to see their jazz band. They're going to be hosting a dinner dance featuring songs by Frank Sinatra. Of course, everyone, including families and alumni, are invited. And then lastly, I am disappointed to have to defer today's agenda item regarding mediation. Um, as a group, we should only enter that agreement as nine colleagues that are willing to do the entire work that is required of it. Unfortunately, with the lack of commitment to this and the attention that is required of the upcoming consideration of the Director of Schools contract requirements, I, feel differing, I felt like deferring excuse me, mediation was best. Please note that I am not abandoning this, and I will continue to work with my colleagues to be of service for my constituents, <coughs> students, our educators, staff, and all towards the everyday and very multifaceted work and betterment that we have of MMPS. Mrs. Bush? Yes, um, the, uh, see the, for the past, what, two board me uh, me meetings, um, I talked very highly about ACT prep that was going on at Cambridge High School. Um, I am excited to announce that uh, we had 100 students to take the ACT uh, last Saturday. And uh, see, I've, I made an announcement. We had 160 students total that attended uh, ACT prep at Cambridge. Uh, if you mind, it's out about 60 of those students. Most of them were middle school and elementary school school students. So they're not really quite ready yet to take the ACT, but they came to prep. So I will come back to the board floor to make an announcement on those scores. Uh, Dr. Battle, are you back there? Yes, we're doing it out there in Cane Ridge, and I'm so excited. Um, one of the things I want to mention about ACT, a lot of these students took this test for the very first time. They were juniors and seniors, which meaning that we have a lot of work to do. If it wasn't for InfoMotion partnering with Cane Ridge High School, these students wouldn't have never had the opportunity to take the ACT and prepare for college. So this is something, again, that I have made a huge deal about, is that we have to be more proactive in making sure that we're giving our students every opportunity and resources to make sure that our students are college and career ready. Again, we're very excited about these students, and I'll come back to the board floor to make an announcement of how these students scored. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I've got uh, four things, uh, and they're not very long. Uh, I failed to read a proclamation, and I'm going to hope that we can just, in spirit, approve this. We've done this for other months, and as you know, this is Black History Month. Um, so the detailed background on Black History Month, the Harvard historian Carter G. Woodson designed Black History Month in 1915. Since 1976, every U.S. president has designated the month of February as an annual celebration of achievements of African Americans and their pivotal roles in U.S. history. So whereas the history of people of African heritage goes back thousands of years and includes some of the greatest, most advanced, and innovative societies in the history of human existence, and whereas during Black History Month, all Americans are encouraged to reflect on the rich history and teachings of African Americans and bear witness to the progress, beauty, and achievements they have made throughout our region, and whereas in 1976, Black History Month was formally adopted to honor and affirm the importance of black history throughout our American experience, and whereas African American students students make up around 42% of the metropolitan Nashville public school system, which joyfully celebrates Black History Month and the many contributions of African American teachers, doctors, lawyers, engineers, architects, soldiers, artists, writers, scientists, and uh, many ordinary people who have demonstrated extraordinary courage, talent, and service to others, be it therefore resolved. The Metro Nashville Board of Public Education issues this resolution to proclaim the month of February 2019 to be Black History Month. Can we in spirit affirm this, please? Yes, 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 yes. And a yes. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to add that there is going to be an event at Robert Churchwell Museum Magnet on Thursday, February 21st from 5.45 to 7.45 p.m., a journey of African-American culture, celebrating the journey of the African-American culture throughout through the language, food, and music of Nashville. Lots of sponsors, so if you're able to attend, please do. So I said something I wanted to share, and I don't normally do this. When I tell you I despise social media, anybody who knows me knows I despise social media. I'm not a good poster. I don't tweet. I'm not good at this at all. So I'm sitting here, minding my own business, doing the school board thing, and this big red blob pops up in my face. It's in my face. Is somebody 
brought to my attention. And in this big red blob that apparently is a screenshot from Facebook, someone who was sitting in this very room during my opening comments about David Williams posted, and I flip and quote, oh good, Sharon Dixon Gentry opened the meeting with an emotional appeal to all of us to keep our mouths shut and not dissent. That was the major takeaway from my opening comments about David Williams. So guys, when we sit here and say that there is something askew in this city uh, with regards to taking sound bites and things out of context, and when I sit here as an African American female, that cannot land on me in a good way. So we can say it's not about race, but what you can't do is take my race away from me. And it is the context through which I view each and every day. Today, uh, this morning on the Steve Harvey show, Steve Harvey said he wished he could wake up one day and not realize he was black and be able to go about his day without that being a concern. So I just, I found that, I guess, appalling. And so I almost decided to respond. I'm not really good at it, so it took a minute, but I didn't respond because as soon as I had the thought to respond, a post popped up in my face from a young lady who put me in as a part of her black history moment and said that she appreciated my referencing this little tattered book that I carry everywhere. And she has a picture of herself holding this book mm -hmm. of her leadership promises for every day by John Maxwell. And so that, that was it. That's all that matters. In this moment going forward, that's all that matters. And I will just say that my reading from these two days, 11th and 12th, have helped me be able to make it to this table today. One of them was entitled Give Up Your Rights, and it really was about, is, and I think someone said that today, is it more important to be right or to take the lessons learned and move forward? And that was from yesterday. And today it was, it's not just what you do, it's when you do it. It's not what you do, but when you do it. And I think that that's a lot of what's been referenced in people's comments today. So I won't take you through the actual verbatim reading, but they're all online. If you want to see them, please do. So I thank each and every one of you for spending your Tuesday evening with us. I thank each and every one of you here in this district, from those to the back holding it down in the cheap seats, to those up here at the front. Thank you so much for being here, and all of our community partners, all of our uh, representatives from the various factions of our community and our school system, from our MNEA to our SEIU and to our community activists sitting right here in front, Ms. Tequila Johnson. I thank you all and our head of the African American Museum for Music and Art and all that other fancy stuff, because y'all keep changing the name on me. Thank you for being here as well. Have a good evening. <coughs> I mean, before we adjourn, I was going to adjourn the meeting. Can I make one motion, or bring notice of a motion? I would just like to move that at the next meeting, I am going to make a motion to release the contents of the HR report. That's all. Thank you. <coughs>